Yeah, here we are. Welcome back to the ZNT Wrestling Show, ladies and gentlemen. And boy, someone save me, if you will, from an underwhelming undercard. Like, someone save me, if you will, and take away all these velocity matches, Tomas. Like, seriously. Oh, yeah. I look at this card, and we are talking about No Mercy 2005, which is next up on the retrospective. Mm -hmm. And I remember as a kid ordering this pay-per-view, and as an adult, I'm looking at this card, and I go... Why the hell did I want this? Why the hell did I beg my parents to slap down forty dollars? Because you wanted, Eddie? yeah, for, you for probably Batista versus the Orton's. Yeah, yeah, I probably wanted to see Batista versus Eddie Guerrero. Probably wanted to see a good old fashioned casket match with the Undertaker and the gimmick. You so. know, we talk <clears throat> about how much we like the split branded pay per views, but then there's shows like this that really show how shallow the rosters can really be. And it just really shows, other than the main event spots, what the hell was SmackDown doing around this time? You could make a case for the mid card, but the mid card is kind of going to get gutted after this pay per view. We're going to see someone leave the company, and we're going to see someone that shouldn't even have been in this match in the first place kind of just go under the radar until they're released. Uh, yep. But this is quite the quite the interesting show. There's a lot of squash matches on here sprinkled in with some decent to good matches there's 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 i'm going to tell everyone know right now there is not a single match on this card that hits the four star mark no this is a painfully average show at best yeah it and is it's very pain... generous to the good matches on the show painfully average but it's not a horrible smackdown event like it's not like <laughs> the it's not it doesn't reach the level of a great american bash or anything like that it doesn't no. reach the level of armageddon 2004 you know like it's or no day oh four for that matter nowhere close nowhere close i would definitely even then judgment day 04 had a banger main event uh yeah this, there is not a single banger on this card you can make a case for one match which I'm looking at this match right now, and it's 10 minutes. But again, even with that match, I'm being very generous with it. I'm trying to find the the, the needle in this haystack that is this painfully average pay-per-view. But you know what? Painfully average is still better than terrible. Yeah, yeah. No, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, this pay-per-view, it should be noted, takes place at the brand new at the time Toyota Center in Houston, Texas, which is a historic wrestling city. Uh, this crowd was all kinds of fired up for this card. Uh, and you definitely see a bunch of the uh, the Texan wrestlers who worked this pay-per-view do the hook'em horns at certain points. Eddie Guerrero was doing the hook'em horns because he hailed from El Paso. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was yeah. cool. It was a good environment, very... I thought. <laughs> a very fired up crowd for they're going to be very disappointed by the end of the night but we are opening up to a very 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 uh, very uh, horrible, just a, a very much there it's one of the matches of all time on this <laughs> card in a six person tag you have the WWE Tag Team Champions the Legion of Doom the Legion of Doom Animal and Heidenreich teaming up with Christy Hemi to take on uh, Mercury, Nitro, and Melina, collectively known as m, &M. I mm -hmm. want to bring this up right now. Uh, ring announcer Tony Chimble doesn't even announce Animal and Heidenreich as the Legion of Doom. He refuses to. He refuses to. Yeah. They are Road Warrior, Animal, and Heidenreich. Which yeah. We were talking about this match as we were watching it, and I tried so hard, probably out of nostalgia, to justify this new LOD. And it's very just hard to because... You just think about Animal and how he was basically being forced to resurrect this old tag team when his, you know, his brother in arms, Hawk, died like two years prior. And yep. now he's being asked to resurrect this tag team with someone who's green as grass, who he barely knows. Yeah. It's very, 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 very strange. I'm trying to find like... And good in this angle but there's really none better yet someone who doesn't even really know how to put the road warrior face paint on because it looked like heidenreich it looked like a middle schooler did his face paint on this card like it, it was really really bad um yeah and the only like endearing thing i can say about this angle was as a kid growing up and like on ww.com watching the journey of heidenreich kind of evolve where he went from you know, winning the tag team titles with Animal at the Great American Bash to slowly earning the face paint. There's a great online segment where Animal is hyping up Heidenreich and he tells him, you know what? 
you've earned your spikes. And he puts the, the shoulder pads on Heidenreich. If this was a better worker, you could look back on this and at least appreciate that. But um, this is the definition of they had nothing for Heidenreich and they were still uh -huh. trying to, to make him work. And on top of all of that, they're not even defending their titles on this pay-per-view. No, nope. six person tag just for the sake of having a six, six person tag to get Molina and Christy Hemi on the card. Christy Hemi, by the way, who was drafted to SmackDown during the draft, but this is the first, you know, emergence of anything. There's no women's title on SmackDown, so there's not really much for the ladies to do. Hell, they even took their best, you know, woman's worker in Tori Wilson and sent her off to Raw. To they did. Back from there. And I have a bone to pick with this opener because. There is zero reason why the tag team titles aren't on the line. We reviewed a pay-per-view in No Way Out 2004 where the titles were being defended in a three-on-two intergender handicap match. Yep. So if they can do that there, there is no reason why Melina can't score the pin and win the tag team titles for her team. Those well, are four. She's their fucking manager. I mean, seeing as how uh, Christy Hemi was the one that got the pinfall, that would mean that Christy Hemi becomes one-third of the tag team champions, and I don't think they wanted that logic gap there. Uh, well, you but, know what? That would at least put a feather in Christy Hemi's cap. Yeah. That she retained the tag team titles for the LOD. Hell, you know what would have been cool? If they would have made her an honorary member of LOD, painted her face, gave her some mini- That's what I was face. thinking. I mean, she was wearing black and red and all that. She had the red hair. Why not paint her face? Give her some shoulder yeah. pads. That would have been really cool. But, you know, that's uh, that's uh, there was really nothing to this match. We're only talking Absolutely about the background nothing. because this crowd, I mean, they were lukewarm at best for it. I mean, they were fired up when the pyro was going off, no pun intended. But um, once this match was going on, like, I mean, there were some, like, timid LOD chants because they knew that this angle was just so tasteless in a lot of different it's ways literally a bastardized version of the legion of doom and it's not even a you know they even mentioned during the entrances on commentary oh animal is dedicating this match to hawk why would he do that i'm sure animal was hurting every single night knowing that hawk isn't there with them again this is like if mark briscoe was forced to replace jay with just some random person and he would call them a briscoe that's yeah. like you don't do that and in Mark's case, it's even worse because he lost his real-life brother to a premature car accident. So mm -hmm. I just don't see any good in this whatsoever. And this match was just, it, it was there. It ends with Christy Hemi actually pulling off a very smooth doomsday device with the assistance of Heidenreich. You could even, yeah. you know, was we'll talk the one that hoisted up the opponent for the doomsday. No, 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 no. So Christy got the assistance from Animal. So at least it was, okay, you know, that. you know, Animal... I, Animal was always the big stocky brute of the two, and Hawk, I feel like, was the more pure athlete between the two. Uh, mm -hmm. He was definitely a lot more agile in there. So Hawk was usually the one who would go off the top rope. Uh, and Chrissy Hemi was taking the Hawk role, and it was a hell of a doomsday device. I mean, Chrissy Hemi was green as grass in the ring, but it was she very tried. effective. Yeah, no, it was very effective. Mm. <sighs> Yeah, and uh, where's Heidenreich now? He's not with the company yeah. anymore, is he? I think I think this is actually his last pay-per-view with the company, if I'm not mistaken. So, a moment of silence for Heidenreich? Nah. Okay, that's enough. Nah, that's yeah. No, nah, that's enough. He sucks. But anyway. This match gets one star, and that star is for Christy Hemi and for Christy Hemi only because she pulled off a good, good doomsday device, and I will give credit where credit is due. You can see spunk in Christy Hemi. She actually likes the business. She is willing to learn. But when you're in an environment in 2005 where you're not given the opportunity to learn. And you're just thrust on the television. Thank you, John Laurinaitis. Thank you for yeah, that. But exactly. um, this was yeah. a nothing match with zero stakes. And it wasn't even fun. It went six minutes. Yeah, not six minutes. Off to this pay -per -view. Yeah, one star. This felt like a like an attitude era uh opening contest almost because yeah. usually like i know everybody glorifies the attitude era but that was mainly because its main event scene was so freaking stacked and like to an extent their mid card and their upper mid card were a lot of fun but their openers they were sending out like freaking blue dust versus gold dust off the top of my head they were sending out like godfather versus naked midian like it wasn't yeah, a good opening match like 
you know, it wasn't Val Venus versus sexual chocolate for the European title. That's <laughs> stupid like that. <laughs> oh, for Christ's sake. Yeah. So that's that's what this felt like. I'm matching Tomas's one star. That one star is for the Doomsday device because I felt like that was a really, really solid, uh, solid effort from Christy. Um, but with that said, it's almost like so Batista was in the locker room. Eddie Guerrero shows up for a chat and they both tell each other good luck. Essentially, we will get to that story when we get to that match and we will get into the background. So uh, before we get <laughs> into this next match, it's very important to point out that WWE has introduced a new concept to these pay-per-views. And it's very like I feel like this was oh, yep. lot better in today's day and age with, you know, Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. But, you know, the internet is still very young in this era, and there's only so much you can do. You can do – the best you can do is, like, forums and stuff like that or do something like this, which is after every match, the winner of the match would go to a booth. And by a booth, I mean it was a table with a computer set up on it, and they would answer questions from the fans live watching the pay-per-view. I actually thought yep. that was a very innovative idea for its time. I'm surprised WWE doesn't do something like that nowadays. Again, you got Twitter. you got Instagram. You got Facebook, you got TikTok, and there's a hell of a lot easier ways to interact with wrestlers now as it was back then. But this is going to be a constant thing going out through the show because WWE is trying to put this idea over, and they would do it for a few months, I want to say. Yeah, I, 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 where they do this. I know for sure they do this for Taboo Tuesday because I owned that DVD. And I yeah, remember just and, being so and, annoyed by how often those instant access uh, little segments were popping up throughout the show. Like, I get why they're doing that, but mm -hmm. I'm like, can we get to the wrestling? Can we get to the wrestling, yeah. please? Like, <laughs> hell, I think they do it well into 2006 because I remember them doing it at New Year's Re Revolution. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, oh man, yeah, a New Year's Revolution 06, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> wouldn't surprise me. So yeah. Again, if they would have did this concept 10, 11 years later when Twitter and Instagram and Facebook <laughs> were starting to boom, it would have worked a lot better. But again, very innovative for its time. We'll be referencing this like a couple of times because, again, this concept is actually going to seep a little bit into the storylines going on backstage. But again, it's Vince McMahon. We got this new idea. We got to shove it in the fans' face every 15 seconds. Correct, yes, but... Oh, Tomasis, I'm sure very excited to talk about this next contest. It is the pay-per-view debut of one of Tomasis' favorite wrestlers, Bobby Lashley. And who is he going up against? Simon Dean! <laughs> Simon and Dean! What is accompanying him to the ring? Uh, so, accompanying, so first of all, Simon Dean makes his entrance. And did you know, Tomas, that Simon Dean was named after road agent at the time, Dean Malenko? Because Dean Malenko's real know. name, did you know that Dean Malenko's real name is Dean Simon? It yeah. is. No, look You're it lying. up. Look it up. His, Dean Malenko's real name is Dean Simon. And they just flipped the names around for Mike Bucci, and they called him Simon Dean. So, anyway, uh, while Tomas is looking that up and fact-checking me, uh, he is accompanied by a big, heavy-set waiter and a chef. No, 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 no. With the Dean, riding to the, the Dean machine, the Dean machine, <laughs> the Dean machine. Uh, the we Dean marked machine out. <laughs> is Simon Dean Segway? Yeah, I didn't well, know they existed back in 2005, but <laughs> Simon Dean rides this thing to the ring. But that is very counterintuitive <laughs> considering Dean is a fitness instructor. He's yes, and exercising, but he's riding a contraption to the ring. You think yeah. Simon Dean would be jogging, he'd be doing jumping jacks, he'd be doing his patented Simon squats. But no, <laughs> he is riding a second way to the ring, and he looks like a major douchebag. Yeah, he's got to rest those uh, calf muscles before he gets in there and wrestles, right? He's got to get yeah, in there and, and rest. <laughs> you were talking about Simon Dean with a big plate of double cheeseburgers. And Simon yep. Dean gets on the mic and he says, you know... He's in Houston, Texas, and he has a plate of 20 double cheeseburgers. And don't get me wrong, I love myself a double cheeseburger sometimes, but if you eat 20 of these in a setting, you are a fat, pathetic slob. Yeah, and it's key. It's where key. It's key to note. Yeah, no, where's the lie? Simon Dean is a uh, <laughs> is basically this uh, vindicated villain, I guess, is the word I'm looking but for. Here's but here's the thing. Did he say that harshly? Sure. But... 
he's not an asshole for saying that. He just no. saying the facts. He Biden said is just hearing what we don't want to hear. He's saying what we don't want to hear. You're missing a key part of this, though. Simon Dean in his promo said that he was doing some research, and he said that Houston, Texas is the number one fattest city in America, and that's why he brought out those 20 double cheeseburgers to prove a point. And he is so confident that he's going to beat this raw, muscle-bound rookie in Bobby Lashley that if he loses, he will eat all 20 of those double cheeseburgers right here tonight. Uh, so that is that is the stipulation going in. Uh, Bobby Lashley makes his entrance. He's wearing white ass trunks. Uh, yes, let's talk about Bobby Lashley for a second. This is actually yeah. a rematch from Lashley's debut on TV on SmackDown. And it was. I remember this so vividly as a kid because Simon Dean comes out to the ring. He says, "Who's my opponent?" And Tony Chimmel says, "Introducing next, making his debut on SmackDown." He's a former Marine soldier, and I'm, like, getting hyped as a kid. I'm like, who the hell is this? Bobby Lashley, here comes out this specimen. He is muscled out of his mind, and I, as a kid, boom, instantly fell in love with him. I was yeah. like, this guy is a beast. He, he is a beast. He, he destroys Simon Dean, and that introduces us into this pay-per-view match, but it is so weird. In 2005, we are watching Lashley. And in 2024, Lashley is still the same. Yeah. He's a better wrestler now, but he is still peak performance shape. He just looks like the total package. And it is crazy that he made his debut in WWE almost 20 years ago. WWE next year, do not sit there and say, oh, this is Lashley's 20-year anniversary to WWE because that motherfucker left for 15 years. Yeah. Don't sit there and say, oh, Lashley, the WWE guy, true and true because he's not because he left and did mma and TNA well, made him a star and then he came back well you know they're going to because they celebrated ray mysterio's wwe anniversary a couple years ago even though ray left for like 2018 yeah yeah ray mysterio was on all in so like why why are we celebrating this guy now but anyway uh bobby lashley you know he gets in there and it's a pretty basic match all things considered this is something that you probably would see on velocity uh he lifts simon dean up like simon dean like tries to use the metal tray holding all the double cheeseburgers as a weapon and he hits lashley in the head with it and Lashley stings up, he no-sells it, looks at Simon Dean, nails him with the Dominator, and pins him one, two, three. Uh, not really much to the match, except for, you know, the angle that was going into it. But So, two things I want to say about it. No, three things, actually. Number one, I love that spot with the, with the metal tray. Oh, that was fantastic. Again, Simon Dean understands the assignment, and he knew he had to put Lashley over like a beast. And the way that whole, like, set, just that whole sequence went out made Lashley look like a beast. Number two, Lashley tried to fling Simon Dean onto his shoulder and swiftly do the Dominator. Lashley, chill out. It's Didn't really work. Match. You're right. It's only your second match. And he botched it like hell. Yeah. Um, yeah. And on top of all of that, I think you, you ask yourself, why am I paying to watch this match on pay-per-view? I think this match would have made a bigger impact if this was Lashley's debut. If they would have saved that whole, you know, oh, Simon Dean coming out and them introducing this monster, you know, they still could have done the cheeseburger thing. They still could have done all of that, even though Vince... He could have done an open challenge. Yeah, he could have done an open challenge. And you could have said, wow, I bought this pay-per-view and I got the debut of what is supposed to be a future main eventer. But considering this is a rematch and the match went, what, less than two minutes? You know, yep. you're kind of wondering one am I paying for this. One minute fifty five seconds on the dot. So exactly, yeah. So that's my only issue with this. And I know it, it, it's WWE pay per view in the mid two thousands. They they do what they want to do, but that was the only thing floating in my head. But you know, after the match, Lashley wins, and the commentators start saying, "Well, is Simon Dean going to do it? He's going to eat all those cheeseburgers." And damn right he does. We will get to that as this pay-per-view goes on. And it really makes you wonder what makes a face and what makes a heel. Because this is so, like, Vince's weird fetish with wasting food. Because, yeah. again, 
Simon Dean uses the silver platter to smack Lashley with it. And before that, he just randomly takes pieces of a burger and throws them off to the side to distract the referee. And it's just like some poor chef spent all day making those cheeseburgers. <laughs> and, took them from catering and they looked and good. They looked like yeah. burgers. Like, they, 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 please don't make that joke until we get to the backstage segment because I, I want you to make that joke. Okay. You know all right. All about. right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. No. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll beg that question when we get to that final segment. But Yeah. But Lashley makes his way backstage. Um, he's about to take his place at the table to start answering questions, but he's met by Teddy Long. That's kind of our foreshadowing for they got big plans in line for Lashley. And Lashley says, actually, excuse me for a moment. And he leaves. We'll get to that soon enough. I don't want to bury the lead too much on Lashley right now. But for the next two years on this retrospective, we're going to be talking about him a lot. Oh, He's yeah. A soft star in this guy. <clears throat> he sure did. He sure did. So speaking of segments, I feel like this should uh, be noted. JBL is in the interview section uh, with uh, an unnamed announcer who I have I did not recognize at all. Like, I, yeah, <laughs> no I, clue I who, it who it was. So, JBL cuts a very weird promo here. He's hyping up his match with Rey Mysterio, and all he can Steve talk... Romero. Who? Steve Romero. Who? Steve Romero. I don't know who that fucking is, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> JBL, uh, he's talking a lot about Raw guys invading the show, and I'm like... This, I mean, it makes sense when you think about Survivor Series the next month, but in the moment, you're like, what does JBL have to do with Raw right now? Like, it's it was very, a very, very weird. Weird and pathetic attempt to start that build. And unless I'm mistaken, don't a couple of Raw guys show up on SmackDown in the build to this pay per view to kind of get that ball rolling? I think but Edge. Is- Edge and Chris Masters, probably, because that's the team yeah. on Taboo Tuesday. And, like, I, I want you all to fucking remember Edge and Chris Masters, because Taboo Tuesday, once that comes along, yeah, that's going to be fucking important. And I want you to remember JBL specifically, because I feel like yeah. JBL cut this promo because WWE really wanted the fans to vote JBL in at Taboo Tuesday. JBL's a heel! <laughs> it's kind of coinciding with the match he has tonight with Rey Mysterio. And speaking of that, you know what? Let's, let's no, 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 no. JBL refers to Rey Mysterio as something very offensive. He calls him a tortilla chip eating jumping bean. And he says he's going to whip him all over Houston, Texas. Like, Jesus, what is, what is Vince McMahon's fetish with racial slurs in his writing? That's what I'm wondering. JBL is a heel and he's doing heel things. And we know JBL isn't that kind of, I don't know. I know. I, I feel like I should stop because I feel like I defend JBL a little too much, but I don't know. Like I can, well, he's not the kind of person in real life. Well, to be fair, Triple H also called Eddie Guerrero a jumping bean at the Royal Rumble. And I know Triple H isn't that kind of guy in real life. So, Oh, you know, absolutely not. But here's the thing before we continue on with Ray, there is a new character that got introduced on SmackDown. Oh so- yes, there is. So Mm -hmm. here's the thing. This is the first time since this conception of the JBL character that started in 2004 where JBL is not involved with the world title picture. Remember, he dropped the long hair, the handlebar mustache, the APA stuff, immediately went into this new character, started a feud with Eddie Guerrero for the title, won the title, you know, lost it at Mania, lost the rematch to Cena, feuded with Batista. This is the first time he's not in the main event picture. So JBL has been losing a few matches on SmackDown, including one to Rey Mysterio. So he thinks he needs his image lifted a little, so he goes out of his way to hire an image consultant. And this is the the debut of Jillian Hall, another character we'll be talking about a lot in this retrospective for the next, shit, five years, five, six years? Crazy. Uh, Some like that. She's with the company up through 2010, at least. 2011, maybe? 2011, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But here's the thing. Again... This is Vince Mc, peak Vince McMahon era right here. Everybody has to have a fucking gimmick. Unless you are a dude with bulging muscles out of your eyeballs, you have to have a gimmick. What's Jillian's gimmick? There's nothing really special about her, but she has this weird festering thing on her face. And as a kid, I had no fucking idea what it was. It was probably I stared at that thing. It was like skin cancer or something that grew nothing. out of control. Yeah, it's so weird I don't know. because as a kid, I was begging WWE, 
just to get a clear shot at it and focus on it so I could figure out what the fuck it was. As an adult, I still don't know what it is. They refer to it as a growth, but it's basically an excuse for them to bully her. Yeah. Jillian Hall doesn't really do anything wrong. She doesn't really interfere in matches. Yeah, she's the manager of a heel, but she doesn't really do anything. JBL but gave her a job. JBL yeah. gave her a job. It's like it's, it's she was hired under like the Fair Employment Act and what have you, despite her uh despite the growth that she has on her face and all that. If JBL yeah, if JBL wants to call it a disability, it's not like it's gonna restrict him from hiring Jillian Hall. He's just giving her but, a job. Like <laughs> And here's the thing. Again, Vince's sick sense of humor, they hammer and I mean hammer and I mean hammer it in that Jillian has this thing on her face. They do not shut the fuck up about this thing on her face. This becomes her defining character trait. It is the only thing they talk about until it is gone. And we're not going to get there until we get there. Until the Royal Rumble. Spoiler yeah, alert. But it is so just weird. Yeah. This day, I don't understand this. I don't even <clears throat> know if you want to call it a gimmick. It's just, oh, look. We have this attractive woman. She don't know if she can wrestle, so we're gonna yeah. put her in this. Here, she is basically post Amy Weber, but Amy, it, but you know Amy Weber didn't really have a character, so they didn't want to repeat. It. I don't know. I don't know. It's just she has a thing on her face. They don't shut the fuck up about it. Enters Rey Mysterio into the picture. Yeah, and he uh, does most of his promo in Spanish, and JBL is offended by the fact that Rey Mysterio is using his native tongue, and he says to speak in English, please, you're in America, like a total Republican asshole. But Rey Mysterio <laughs> looks at JBL, and he says, you know what? You're going to want to hide your face in shame after you lose, and me and my left knee with all the surgeries I've had. So he looks at JBL, <laughs> he hands him like a mask that is sold at the merch tables, I'm sure. And he's like, like 10 bucks back then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Maybe> well, <five. laughs> could you imagine? Yeah, it was like one of those little plastic masks. It wasn't like a replica yeah. mask, like the kids it's would have it. The, it's basically what the parents would buy the kids when they would say, Ooh, $99 for a mask? Hell no. But here's the thing if a Rey Mysterio mask cost $99 today, I'd have like 10 of them. Yeah. <laughs> I remember skimming through WWE Magazine, seeing the catalog, and seeing a replica Rey Mysterio mask. For only ninety nine dollars, you know, probably a hundred and ten with shipping and handling. But like, we would kill for that deal nowadays. <laughs> yeah, thank you, inflation. Uh, but yeah. Ray Ray presents the masks to JBL, and JBL is appalled by this. And Ray Mysterio is like, well, "What are you talking about? I wasn't talking about you. I was talking about her." And I'm like, "Jesus, Ray, don't be a bully. Be a star. Your baby should face." We, <laughs> should I bring up this point now? Yeah. Okay, wait till the match. Uh, you can wait till the match, and you can uh, okay. we can start talking about the next match. I got to go ahead and plug okay. in, but you can Sounds go ahead good. and introduce the next segment. You know what? I don't know if I want to say this is match of the night. It's one of the better matches of the night. Uh, for the fatal four way, we have the United States Championship on the line. Chris Benoit is defending against Booker T, Christian Cage, and his penultimate match in WWE. Remember that. Not even. This may be his last match on pay-per-view. It is. He's scheduled for Taboo Tuesday. Yeah, he is scheduled for Taboo Tuesday, but we'll get to that pay-per-view when we get to that pay-per-view. So this is the last match on pay-per-view for Christian and Orlando Jordan. And the man, the man who lost to Crispin won under a minute, not once, not twice, but three times. Why is he getting another title match? Because I guess these, these three blokes had a triple threat match on SmackDown to determine who faces Benoit this show. And Benoit was like, why even have this match? I'll just fight all three of them. Because I guess his character is he's a fighting champion. Yeah, it's basically, again, Benoit's defining character trait at this point in his career. He's not going anywhere near the World Heavyweight title again for the rest of his career. So mid-card purgatory it is for Benoit. Um, they have an interesting good thing going on with Booker T, which I kind of already started talking about in the Great American Bash Review. And that's... His wife, Charmel, is accompanying him to a lot of matches during this run. But, you know, you talk about her actions in the ring, her actions during the matches, you know, slapping Christian, getting involved. That's some heel shit right there. And yeah. He's this white meat baby face right now. So Booker's, so, so time out. Booker's supposed to be a baby face on this card, right? Yes. Because, I mean, 
I feel like he's only a babyface by proxy because this pay per view is in Booker's hometown. So, I mean, I totally understand why Booker was here in this babyface role. I totally get why he lost the match the way he did uh, because it only furthers his heel turn and it only, you know, starts planting the seeds for that. And I feel like yes. the storytelling was pretty effective. Um, it was weird. It was weird because Charmel makes her entrance. Sign guy has a really ridiculously, uh, you know, offensive saying on one of his signs as Charmel makes her entrance that I dare not repeat, but Charmel gets in the ring and she introduces Houston's own Booker T and she doesn't get cheers until Booker comes out because he's Houston's yeah. boy. And Taz has the line of the night during Booker T's entrance and says, you know, uh, Charmelle is wearing a dress tonight, but sometimes she wears the pants. And I'm like, oh, they're really hammering it in that Booker is a cuck for his wife. <clears throat> he sure is. He sure is. Oh, man, I can't wait to get into uh, Booker's character development. Um, so this fatal four-way happens, and it's a, uh, I would say it was a really solidly wrestled match. Um, it wasn't like one of the best fatal four ways you'll ever see but like benoit was again out of this world in this match like carrying it technically christian was really freaking great booker was on his game orlando felt like he was just there like it just felt like he yeah. was the, it felt like he was the guy that had no shot like jordan was a complete non-factor in this match again it's kind of offensive that he's in this match at this point because he has lost like four times to Benoit since SummerSlam. And it's like, it became a running joke on SmackDown, but you're basically yeah. handing this guy title matches for doing nothing. For and losing I to Benoit in 25 and a half seconds. Like, that's the only reason why he's getting this match, because it's a joke at this point. So much yeah. so that very early on in this match, Benoit slaps the crossface on Orlando Jordan while they're alone in the ring, not even a minute in. And Christian realizes, oh, shit. If I don't get in there now, Jordan's going to tap to this crossface. So thank God there were other people in the match that stopped Jordan from tapping. But And again, I talked about this at Great American Bash, and it's really apparent here. Christian is wrestling this match with a goddamn chip on his shoulder. Oh, yeah, he is. No, Christian was... Because, man, he was again, great in this. This is peak Christian. He did this stuff on Raw. You know, they teased the stuff with him and John Cena, which was a total missed opportunity. He comes to SmackDown. There is a plethora of opponents for him to wrestle. He could compete with Batista for the world title. He could compete against The Undertaker. He could mm -hmm. really take advantage of the strengths he was building. And here they have him, which, again, the United States title isn't totally, like, bastardized or anything, but it's not the hottest thing on the card, and Christian mm -hmm. could be doing better things. Well, I mean, to be completely fair, let me counter it by saying this. The United States title, I don't feel like would be as prestigious as it was at this point in time mm -hmm. if if Benoit was not holding on to it. Because keeping in mind, yeah. Benoit won the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 20. They can never take that away from him. And him holding on to that mid-card title makes it such a huge target. And it makes it mm -hmm. such a valuable prize to actually add to your resume. So... I don't blame, like, all three guys. I don't blame WWE for booking Chris Benoit as the U.S. champion for oh, God no, knows how bad. long they did. Like, Christian could have been doing better things, all yeah. things considered. And you, you bring up a good point, too. Benoit was the guy to end that very, very, very nothing title reign of Orlando Jordan, which he was the guy who beat John Cena for it. And literally two months in, the United States title was a complete afterthought. So I do appreciate the effort that's being put in the mid card at this time. And it definitely does get better with, you know, spoiler alert, the Benoit and Booker feud they're going to get into in the fall leading yep. into the year. But my favorite parts of this match were the Benoit and Christian sequences. I don't think yeah. we've ever seen these guys tie it up one-on-one. -on -one. And when it was just them two in the ring, it was really good. They might have had one-on-one -on -one matches on random episodes of SmackDown here and there, but those mm -hmm. guys tore it up in there. I would have loved to seen them have a pay-per-view match. Um, I have a question for you, actually. It might sound a bit unrelated, but it sort of is. Do you think by this point, Christian's mind was made up that he was leaving WWE? 100%. Think so? Yeah. And that's why I say he's wrestling with a goddamn chip on his shoulder, because he could have been telling Vince, this is what you're losing. I am yep. at the top of my game right now, and, I, and, he, and not only can he, he does go to Ring of Honor, go to TNA. 
and show the world that he can be a fucking main eventer. It was mm-hmm. just today I was listening to Solo Monsters Review on Raw, and he brought up a good point about Christian. Christian in WWE, Vince never liked him. Vince straight up said, Christian, you are ugly, and I don't want you on my television screen. So you can only understand Christian's frustration at this point. So the fact that he's in this very tail end of his first WWE run, he's like, you know what? Fuck you guys. Uh, Not only am I going to leave, I'm going to show you how damn good of a wrestler I am on my way out. Yeah. You know what? I feel like he pulled a Cody Rhodes before Cody Rhodes ever pulled a Cody Rhodes. You know? It was just... When he came back to WWE... They did fucking no nothing with him. No, no story for Christian to finish except for when uh, his buddy Edge retired. Then he finally yeah. finished the story. But um, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that when we get to that. Um, yeah, again, so, get our thoughts out about Christian now because we're going to touch on him on Taboo Tuesday. But yeah. retrospective-wise, 2009. Yeah, the 2009. reason... The reason why I ask that about Christian is honestly because... He takes six German suplexes in this match from Benoit, who is a very stiff worker, who was a very stiff worker. Um, Christian was the guy that tapped out to Benoit in the sharpshooter. Spoiler alert. Not even the crossface. Christian tapped out to the sharpshooter. So, Which, nothing against that. You know me, I love when wrestlers have multiple finishers. It's just so like, oh, this guy can beat you in so many different ways. But yeah. sharpshooter in Texas, I can understand if they were in Canada. Yeah, I can understand if they were more like a heart territory, little random, huh? But I like the sharpshooter in Benoit's repertoire, and it's not the only time he's going to win with that move, so it gets a pass for me. Yeah, it gets a pass. It honestly, it, the best thing I can compare it to is like a Gunther finish for an IC mm-hmm. title match because Gunther has like at least a dozen different ways that he can end a title defense. And I feel like if they wanted to do that same sort of thing with Benoit, where he can win with a diving headbutt. God forbid. He can win with the crossface. He can win with the suicide dive. He can win with the sharpshooter. You know, it's like mm. they could have pulled that off with Benoit, but this is the only real time that he wins with the sharpshooter in his U.S. title picture um, run. I can think of a few other times in 2006 he does it, but it's not put on as prominently yeah. as we would like it to. Because like you said, Gunza can win a match with a clothesline, a power bomb, a chop. A Boston crab, uh, you know, lion tamer, lion tamer, Boston crab. Um, <laughs> you know, he used to have a finishing move called the Last Symphony, but I looked at that move, I'm like, Gunther doesn't fucking need this move. He no, power bomb your ass in the next week and win a match. Exactly. But you know, I, I, I definitely get what you're saying. Benoit retains in a in a fun match. I'll give it three and a half stars, or it was only ten minutes. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'll go three and a quarter. I'll go three, three and a three quarter because it, it's a more fair. I'm, again, that's me being a little too generous to this pay-per-view when it's not. If it, mm. let's see. I feel like if it went a little bit longer and there was a bit more creativity with spots involving all four guys, because this mm-hmm. felt like a fatal four-way where you had two guys go in the ring and then, okay, we have one guy tag out and then we have like reps going in, going in and out, you know, like substitutions. But, um, yeah, Orlando Jordan was pretty much a non-factor. Booker T was not involved in the finish. Christian certainly felt like he was being punished for wanting to leave at this point by being the mm-hmm. fall guy in this. But, yeah, no, Benoit I mean, wins. It was a fun enough match. So We can touch on this more in the Taboo Tuesday review, but I feel like there was a rumor, or not a rumor, but like kind of like a shoot work thing going on at the pay-per-view where Christian did go into Vince's office after Taboo Tuesday and say, I, I'm done, I'm out of here. Yeah. He was pretty fed up. And I remember on the DVD extras where Christian is leaving Vince's office and he tells, I don't know who's interviewing it, maybe Josh Matthews, but he straight up tells him, like, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm wow. not in WWE anymore. I, um, man, I have that DVD too. I'll, I'll, I'll look at it and see if that's on the extras. But um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but fun match. This match felt more like it was less about the match and more about the storyline afterward because after Benoit leaves, Charmel is outside of the ring and she is screaming at Booker T, mm-hmm. calling him a loser, calling him pathetic, saying that should be you. You should have won the title. Benoit is not your friend. You need to stop thinking that he's your friend. And after that, they hit Booker's music. And I'm like, why are you so weird? Music? He fucking lost. <laughs> and later on, she says that Chris Benoit is not the problem. You are the problem, Booker. And we I will think more into that segment when we get after the next match because. 
it <sighs> plays a factor to that. But again, Charmel is motivating her husband, but she's straight up just like bullying him. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. taking her frustrations out that he lost the match. And Booker's not having it. Booker's like he's reaching a boiling point in his career. Considering yeah. we are almost a year ago, he turned face after turning heel, which, you know, in Booker's defense and his development, he got mm-hmm. drafted to down in 2004 and they've done jack shit with him. He never won the WWE title. He can't win the United States title. He's trying to please the fans. He's trying to please himself. And again, he's reaching a point. He's, he's in a, a slump. Point. He's in a yeah. slump. So he will turn heel and it will be probably one of the best career moves for Booker T, which is ironic me saying that because I've always felt like Booker T was a much more organic baby face than he was a heel. But, you know, we'll, well, we'll talk more about that when we dig deeper into it. Yeah, sometimes we'll be talking about that. And no, no, not till Judgment Day, never mind. But sometimes you need to reinvent yourself. And Booker reinvents himself. Big time, big time. Uh, before we get into this next contest, there is a shot of Bobby Lashley forcing Simon Dean to eat the 20 double cheeseburgers, and Simon Dean is already miserable. And Lashley's like, be a man of your word. Eat the 20 double cheeseburgers, Simon. <laughs> this promo delivery is so bad. But... Yeah, I was going to talk about that because I don't mean to jump around, but, you know, this is where you can tell Lashley has a lot of work to do because Simon Dean is pleading with Lashley. He's trying to negotiate with Lashley. And all Lashley says is, eat him. <laughs> eat him. And Simon's like, that. <laughs> it kind of makes Lashley look like a bully. Yeah. Because you... Simon Dean is doing everything. He's pleading. He's trying to negotiate with Lashley. Like, it's not like he, you know, threw a burger in Lashley's face and says, I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat the shit out of you. If God. Not, I'm going to eat all these cheeseburgers. He just said, if I lose, I'm going to eat these cheeseburgers. And now Lashley is like, trying to force these burgers down his throat. It's kind of could, disturbing. Could you imagine WWE nowadays running a segment like this that was heavily sponsored? It was like huge product placement. Like, say it's like, what do these burgers look like? They look like Carl's Jr. Let's just go with that. If this were like a Carl's Jr. commercial, do you think that this would make the casual viewer want to go to a Carl's Jr. and eat their burgers? Mm-hmm. No, because Lashley bullied Simon Dean damn near into an eating disorder. <laughs> Car- disturbing to watch. Carl's Jr. Eat him. <laughs> Do you want to make the joke now? Uh, what was Simon well, Dean thinking. What was Simon well, Dean thinking? Looking at those burgers. Uh, what what was he thinking? Uh, uh very pulp fictiony. Oh, oh shit! Yeah, that is a tasty burger. Hmm. There you go. That hey, Lashley. Lashley, have you ever had an In-N-Out burger before? <laughs> Probably not, because you're from Colorado. And they're not in Colorado, motherfucker. Hey, they're in California. They're... <laughs> but you know what? They're in Houston. Lashley could just swing around the corner and get a Whataburger. No, no, no. I've heard Whataburger is shit. So, yeah. Oh, okay, I was going to say, have you had Whataburger before? Have you been to Texas before? No, <laughs> I have I know plenty of people who have, and I don't plan on ever going to Whataburger because it's, it just sounds like it's overrated. So, if anybody hey, from Texas... On. If anybody from Texas happens to be listening to this podcast or watching this video and disagrees with me, let us know down in the comments. Uh, and uh, okay. show us, show us how... And then five guys. Five men? Top tier. Top yeah. tier. S tier right mm-hmm. there. S- if I want an actual <laughs> good burger that isn't McDonald's or Jack in the Box, those two right there. Oh, yeah. Can't be good. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so before we get more hungry, let's get into this next match. Um, okay. You want to talk about more debuts, Tomas? Yeah. It is uh, yeah. Hardcore Wait, Holly. It, it, yeah, yeah. so it's uh, Bob Holly, the spark plug, going up against... Mr. Kennedy! 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 Yep. Mr. Holy Kennedy! Fucking shit. Are you Mr. ready for yeah. this fucking can of worms to be opened? Oh boy. The, the potential that was there with Mr. Kennedy. I don't want to bury the lead right away. But no, this character, gonna, he. This is going to be a wild fucking ride (laughs) he feels like this brash young arrogant typical heel that you would see debut on smackdown around this time very vanilla in a sense but because 
because Vince loved his gimmicks at the time, Mr. Kennedy is also his own ring announcer. And this motherfucker always has this old school microphone dropped down from the ceiling like he's calling a boxing match or something. And he runs down the crowd in Houston. He insults Tony Chimmel very often for doing a horrible job. And he always says that he weighs in tonight at 246 pounds. An amazing 246 pounds. And he always, like, has to enunciate every word as he goes on. That was pretty good. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He hails from Green Bay, Wisconsin. (laughs) You know, I'm just going off the SmackDown versus Raw intro that he had recorded. So... Um, oh, pretty damn good. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm working on it. Before we get into this match, which is a really nothing match, Mr. Kennedy, the name, the presentation, the gimmick, his honestly god tier mic skills. I loved it all. Yeah, loved it, loved it. Loved it. it was Me too. A great presentation. It is a quintessential heel gimmick. Like he is just so uh, conceited and he's he, pompous. He's the best thing. He's pompous. And he's so easy to hate. That is all great. As a wrestler, though, yeesh. He's not horrible. Not by any stretch of He's not like the worst wrestler that ever lived. He has his moments throughout his career. But I'm going to say this right now. As a wrestler in the ring, he's one of the most overrated wrestlers of all time. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, he really is. And uh, this match against Bob Holly certainly does not help his case of uh, being a great wrestler. Not to say that Bob Holly himself is a bad worker, but you could sense that the story was there. It was built in. As it was mentioned at the Royal Rumble earlier in 2005, Bob Holly hates rookies, and that's why he beat the fucking shit out of Daniel Pewter. So you can only imagine what he's trying to do to this brash guy. Yeah, real quick, before we go on any further, I don't know what. I'm trying to do some research right now, but the whole saying his name twice thing is a reference. He was interviewed, and he was asked, like, hmm. why do you say your name twice? I always thought it was, like, an echo effect. Was that a... Said, it's a it, it's a reference to something. Hmm. Was that a Chris Van Vliet episode, or was that something else? No, it's... It was way back in the day when he first started wrestling and all that. Oh, oh, okay. I got you. Yeah. So so. here's my thing. You bring up Bob Holly and his hatred for rookies. I feel like at this point in Bob Holly's career, he's not dangerous per se, but he Mm -hmm. will not hesitate to stiff the fuck out of you if you even breathe in the wrong direction. Yeah. So just a fed up veteran that did not give a shit at this point. Yeah. It it showed in this match. Again, you even accidentally step on his foot he will fucking stiff you stiff you to hell tougher than a two dollar steak indeed so that's what it makes tough they are they are yeah uh jr says so but i i will give credit to this match where it's due actually for how stiff these guys were being with each other there was outside brawling there were steel stair spots i believe they were fighting by the uh spanish announce table um these guys (laughs) these guys get in this ring and then they chop the hell out of one another like i am shocked that kennedy's chest did not turn a bright red because of how hard bob holly was chopping him yeah and i feel like the stiffness in this match was like an accident it was more like kennedy's green not green but like he's inexperienced and bob holly was probably just pissed so we stepped the fuck out of him and they started stiffing each other aside from that this was a very boring match and it was eight minutes too long no, oh, I liked it. I liked the match. I liked how stiff they were. I liked Bob Holly's drop kick, of course. Bob Holly has one of the better drop kicks I've seen in the business. Uh, Kennedy hits a very, very snug version of his finisher, which would later become known as the Green Bay Plunge. It's basically, if for those of you who don't know what a Green Bay Plunge is, think John Cena's fireman's carry, like he's getting someone ready for the attitude adjustment. But Kennedy does a senton bomb or a Jeff Hardy flip off the top rope. and With the opponent on his shoulders. It's a devastating finisher. It's a very impressive finisher. Mm-hmm. My only issue with it, it takes too much setup. It's yeah, not it's... a snappy finisher you can hit out of nowhere. Like an RKO. Like an attitude adjustment. Hell, even with a little setup like a Batista bomb or a choke slam. It's a little too much setup for my taste. I think it was there for the spectacle in the beginning, 
uh, Kennedy would get a lot better, more easier finisher as the as he goes down. He actually gets a couple of finishers. He actually the mic check, mic check. He does the Swanton bomb, which he calls the Kenton bomb. Which yep. honestly, yeah, not a bad Swanton whatsoever. No way. Um, as he gets further into his career, it's going to show that the Green Bay plunge is just so inconvenient to hit. And like you said, it is very snug. He beats Holly. He gets a pay per view victory. And we're going to be talking about Kennedy a lot. Especially yeah. Especially next year and beyond. I'm going to so give this match two stars, believe it or not. I didn't think this match was terrible. I didn't think it was terrible. It was just really, it was, I thought it was too long. It existed. It nine minutes. I think they could have cut it in half and it still could have gotten the point across. Um, I'll give it a star and a half just because I was, I was bored. Damn. Was very bored watching this match. All right. Fair enough. But Bob Holly, uh, after the match, uh, oh, I mean, he's like, is it even, there's even, is there yeah. even any point to bringing this up. He's holding on to his ribs, and I didn't even think he was selling it. I think the Green Bay plunge that night was really that snug, and Bob Holly was actually kind of hurt. He might have cracked a rib yeah, there. Yeah, because the referees try to help him up, and Bob Holly goes, get away from me. Don't touch me. And he's, like, fucking mad that he mm-hmm. is hurt. But then when he's rolling out of the ring, he goes, are you guys going to help me or not? It's like, Bob, Bob. Like, Make please. up your mind. You're an asshole. They try Make up your you. mind. You tell them to get away from you. They don't help you, and now you're mad they're not helping you. I'm not a huge fan of Bob Holly. <laughs> Fair really enough. Not. Fair enough. Um, but Bob Holly is uh, is paid a visit. Uh, you want to talk about uh, forgettable gimmicks around this time? He's visited by a former member of La Resistance, Sylvan, who is basically the fashion consultant for Friday Night SmackDown. Think Tyler Breeze without the cool factor. Like that's what Sylvan was, and Sylvan gets in there. He uh, basically is gloating in Bob Holly's face because he lost. Sylvan hits his finisher, and he's gone. He's out of there. Uh, waste of time. <laughs> waste of time. That's all I got to say. I hope you enjoyed that quick synopsis about Sylvan, because that is the only time we're going to talk about him on this retrospective. He's in the Royal Rumble match, too. Is he? Yep. Fuck. He is in the Royal Rumble match. Um, so you I- mean to tell me that you couldn't give Rene Dupree a chance as a single star? But you're going to repackage Sylvan. Yeah. Yeah. Because everybody needs a gimmick, right? Everybody needs a gimmick. Sylvan is a former model. I like Rene Dupree. I do too. Yeah. He had potential. Mm hmm. I I liked Rene Dupree too. They they wasted him away for this. Mm hmm. Yep. He he robbed us of Beefy. Yeah. I don't, I mean, maybe I shouldn't blame Sylvan, but this is. This is we don't see Fifi anymore on TV. Would you be for this? Would you be intimidated by a man named Sylvan? No. <laughs> would I you remember be in... one other thing of Sylvan? He wrestles Rey Mysterio on SmackDown, and he That's probably it. loses. Oh yeah, absolutely, he does. Yeah. Would you be intimidated by a dog named Fifi? No, because there's more than one of them. <laughs> Fucking hell, Fifi Kate is real. Do you think it was the same dog every time? No! No! Fuck no! No, I believe it. Fifi Gate is absolutely 100% not a myth. I believe it! There it is. Here's the thing. Full stop. If Dupree got a different dog for every show, who's to say Jake the Snake Roberts didn't have a different snake, didn't have a different Damien every show? Who's to say... Um, Who's this? Coco Beware didn't have a different Frankie every show. Who's to say that Jake Roberts even had a snake in the bag at all? Like, sometimes he didn't even pull the snake out. Fair. So, But there are horror stories, I think, from DDP, where I guess they were riding together one time at a show, and Jake Roberts called him and said, fuck, I left Damien in the trunk. Yeah. <laughs> so horrible. he suffocates in there. But... Absolutely horrible. Yeah. Yeah, I would rather sit here and talk about Fifi Gate for another hour than talk about Sylvan again. <laughs> that might be another special uh, podcast that we do, a Rene Dupree retrospective. <laughs> Animals in wrestling. I want to yeah. talk about Matilda. Animals. <laughs> I want to talk about Matilda the Bulldog. I want to talk about Chloe. <laughs> I do too. I, I want to talk about Chloe. Fatal Four right here. Pharaoh, Chloe, Matilda, and oh fuck what. Uh, what's CM Punk's dog name again? Larry. Larry. <laughs> Fucking 
Book it. <laughs> Pharaoh Book would that shit. No offense, but Pharaoh would probably eat Larry alive and then spit him out. So... <laughs> Question of the day down in the comments. Do you think Pharaoh is a goofy odd dog like The no, Rock says? Don't fuck what The Rock says. No, Pharaoh is beautiful. Um but yeah, he doesn't run in a mania. We're we're this podcast really has gone off the rails as usual, Tomas. As well, usual, yeah, it's not fun unless it does. <laughs> we're um, fucking so fun. Do you want to talk about more Bobby Lashley and Simon Dean to, uh, segments backstage? Because yeah, like we, we do get another one. We do get another one. Dean is still back there. He's like halfway through the plate of burgers and he is pleading with Lashley. Oh, Lashley says like, mm, those burgers look good, but they're all yours. And Dean is like begging Lashley and he goes, I can't do it anymore. I feel sick. I can't. Well, to be fair, I can barely finish one burger. You're asking a man to eat 20 of them. And then Simon Dean goes, Lashley, how about, how about this? I will cut a deal with you. I will eat like half of them. Or I'll only eat the meat. I'll only eat the meat. I, I can't do all these extra carbs. And Lashley looks at him and goes, eat them. <laughs> like, this poor man is trying to bargain with you. You're going to like give him a stomach closer. He's going to puke his brains out. He's gonna, oh, my God. You're going to give him hemorrhoids, Lashley. <laughs> yeah, like he's going to develop like a gluten allergy or something. And you are literally forcing food down this man's throat. He's going to have an eating disorder by the end of this. Eat him! <laughs> and that's what I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not trying to make light of eating disorders, but this is how they start. Yeah. No, you don't say. You don't say. But uh, there's one burger that Dean picks up, and he finds a hair in it. Uh, oh, like, what the fuck? Well, yeah. What happens when you throw burgers on the floor at a fucking wrestling show? Again, could you imagine uh, a sponsor for this whole series of segments? Like if McDonald's was the sponsor here, like I'm loving yeah, it. McDonald's again. I, I'm I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm loving it. There's a hair in again. it. It's like I a. Never eat again. It's like a hit piece instead of a commercial. <laughs> I mean, they're already selling the anime sauce right now, so that would be the final nail on the coffin. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and then Bobby Lashley looks at you and says, Eat him! <laughs> Bobby Lashley? <laughs> anime Bobby Lashley with the anime sauce? <laughs> Bobby Lashley in the commercial with the anime sauces, he looks, he looks at the bottle and then he smiles and he looks at you and he says, Eat him! <laughs> Eat him! <laughs> oh, God. So, do you want to talk about this next match before my sides start fucking hurting me <laughs> from laughing oh so much? Um, <laughs> we, 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 we kind of, like, previewed it in the backstage segment already, but it is John Bradshaw Layfield in his first not-world title match on a pay-per-view since God knows when. Again, since donning this character. And he's going one-on-one -on -one with Rey Mysterio. How did this match come to be? Um, JBL just got out of a feud. Rey Mysterio just got out of a feud. They got nothing to do. You want to wrestle? Each other. You want to wrestle? Think, yeah. In all seriousness, um, Ray does defeat JBL on SmackDown, and that starts the whole JBL. He's in a slump. He needs an image consultant. So we got Jillian Hall to basically, you know, boost his morale and all that. And that's basically it's an excuse for these guys to wrestle on pay per view. Basically, yes. yeah. Um, and it's I also think very. Oh yeah, no. Were we're you gonna get into it because this is the debut. Of Rey Mysterio's Buyaka 619 on oh, Reckless Intent. That, yeah, so Rey Mysterio makes his entrance, and I vividly remember this because I ordered this on pay-per-view as well. Rey Mysterio has this new, like, rap-style song. It's not, like, crossing borders from, uh, from what was it, WWE Originals was the CD? Yeah, um, no, it's a very, 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 very much needed change of pace for Rey because I'm going to tell you something right now. I hated his original theme song. Really? I hated it. it was dated, and the lyrics made no fucking sense. Who's Some that lyrics... jumping out the sky? R.E.Y. Mysterio. Here we go with the That's mask the out when the me. pass out. <laughs> yeah, the girls, they pass out. When is Better Ray tap been out. Ladies, man? Better when tap out. Been a ladies man? When has Ray made anybody tap out? Thank you. <laughs> Another one of the lyrics. Sitting on my neck, where's the ref? Ray, you're getting pinned. Why do you want the referee to show up? <laughs> Why do you want the referee to show up? You want to lose? You want to fucking lose? <laughs> you want to lose? 
<laughs> God damn it. That's like if you stole something and said, where's the cops? Where's the cops? <laughs> I got the money right here. Where's the cops? You, you make a great point. You make a really great oh, point. I... And one last point. Who can remove the mask? Why? Because he's whooping your ass. When has Ray ever whooped anyone's ass? Uh, That's a lot people he's outthrown a lot of people but has he ever whooped someone's ass yeah no he whooped eddie guerrero's ass at SummerSlam. i would say so well, that's another point i want to bring up um before we get back into the theme song ray is just getting off of the eddie feud <clears throat> it did not end SummerSlam. like i said they had a very underrated match on smackdown and then they had a steel cage match it's a very underrated steel cage match go out of your way to watch it it's very good eddie, eddie finally gets the win Congratulations, Eddie. You are like one in eight against Rey Mysterio. Yep. Yep. He beats Rey Mysterio inside the cage match, and that's probably what gets him the title shot on this show. But uh, Rey comes out to a, ver a banger rendition of Booyaka with the nice little drum beats in the background. I've always loved that. I've always loved that about this <laughs> version. And I will say it. This version, the OG version of Booyaka, no, is greater no. than the current. Yes, it no, is. No, yes, it not. is. No, Fuck you. No, yes, it is. No, it's not. P.O.D. goes harder. Uh, this is all POD. It was POD from the beginning. <laughs> I'm talking about the better version of it that he I, debuts like next year because bro, I, Tech comes out next year. One of the best wrestling albums of all time. I promise you it is all POD. This was POD on this show. It was absolutely POD. No question about it. It has more of a POD influence on it. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I just feel like, yeah, it feels like a P.O.D. influence, but this one feels like P.O.D. with a Rey Mysterio influence. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel it, yeah. And you know what? Now that I brought it up, when it comes out, I do want to talk about Reckless Intent because that is the best wrestling album of all time. That was like the album I was waiting for that had almost every single wrestling track I wanted. And remember, this is back in like 05, 06 where – you couldn't just go on to Spotify and listen to whatever theme song. You couldn't just go to Apple Music. You had to wait for albums to come out. And I had a little CD player, and that's all I listened to. I listened to it so much that people were starting to ask me, do you like real music? And I'm like, motherfucker, this is real music. <laughs> it is real music, Saliva, yeah. P.O.D., Silk the Shocker, Fuck Off. Those are all real music. Alter hard Bridge. Music. Thank you. <laughs> Sing whoever the hardest rapper of our generation. Whoever, who, yeah, whoever the fuck sings uh, "Burning My Light," I don't remember. Mercy Drive. <laughs> Mercy Drive. Thank you. Yeah, no, Ray I was gonna... is the one who introduced me to Rev Theory. Come on, yeah. Like, wrestling music is gateway into real music. So shut the fuck up, everyone. Back then was saying like, do you, do you not listen to anything other than wrestling music? I am like eleven years old. What do you want me to listen to? <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> anyhow. Um, Jillian Hall you know, does it. Going to a lot of tanks on this podcast. It's okay. Let, yeah, I don't care. Thanks, Tomas. This, <laughs> this podcast is for me. <laughs> this podcast has gone off the rails, but uh, Jillian Hall oh, makes her entrance with JBL, and Michael Cole and Taz just cannot stop insulting her about this growth on her cheek. Like Taz, you know what this is? What? I'm sorry. This just popped up in my mind. <clears throat> you know when uh, Deadpool. When Weasel just makes joke after joke after joke after not funny joke after not funny joke after not funny joke after TJ Wilson is not a good actor, not funny joke after TJ Wilson is not funny after not funny joke about Wade's face. Yeah. That's what this was. It's just Taz making the most unfunny remarks about Jillian's face. TJ Wilson is not a good actor. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, just stay tuned for when I review Deadpool 1 and 2 and the build up to 3, but um, uh, yeah. no, Any we'll get to that. That reminds me of, because you're right, the commentators, mainly Taz, do not shut the fuck up about this. What did, it is what like did, the only thing they talk about. What did Jillian Hall do to deserve all this, like, hate at her? She's just working. Nothing. She's just yeah. out there working. She's doing her job. She has a clipboard out there. She's working. She... <laughs> I guess As if you're, child, I guess if you're a manager, you're... if you're a manager and you come out with a clipboard like you're Dana Brooke, like that obviously means you're working, like you're a statistician or something. Like, <laughs> so I'm sure both me and you were raised as children that if you saw someone on the streets that like didn't have a hand, or maybe they only have three fingers, or you know they have a deformity on their face, we were taught. 
don't stare, don't say anything, be polite, be respectful. All of that stuff we were taught as kids gets thrown out of the fucking window with this feud. Mm-hmm. They say, aha, she has a thing on her face. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about nothing about it. Let's not, let's re- forget the fact that Jillian Hall is a beautiful woman. Yeah. Let's forget about all of that and just talk about that thing on her face. Yep. <laughs> has even oh. said, every, everything else about her is nice, but that mole looks like a bumper on the back of a car with a possum on it. <laughs> cool. Oh, That's nice. That's nice. Fucking That's weasel nice. ass level humor. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, these two guys actually work a pretty solid match, all things considered. I think it's one of the better JBL matches you're going to see, um, especially at this stage of his career. They play a very fun game of cat and mouse where Rey Mysterio is like running away from the big giant here, uh, constantly running in and out of the ring and frustrating him. Uh, would you qualify? Would you, I mean, not qualify, but like categorize JBL as a Haas? Oh, good question. I think, I think the JBL of like 2000, 2001 would probably be considered a Haas, but this JBL has a dad bod. So it's yeah, like, I was going to bring that up because you talk about the game of cat and mouse where Ray is running from JBL. He's going into the ring. He's going outside of the ring to get away from JBL, and JBL is gassed by the mm-hmm. end of it. And when oh, I yeah. see that spot, I go, this is at the point in JBL's career where he really lets himself go, and he is really depending on his, his knowledge of the business and ring psychology to get him through these matches because the athleticism is, like, non-existent at this point. Not there. I mean, he can still hit a mean fallaway slam. Last call. Uh, last call, Scott Hall. But uh, he hits a fallaway slam off the second rope, hits a fallaway slam on the floor, which looked massively painful. I don't know if Rey Mysterio was all selling that, but... Yeah, and I don't want... Honestly, it's a good point to bring up because, not to bury the lead, um, JBL is kind of entering the last phase of his career. Mm-hmm. Like, out of nowhere, too. So you can tell in the ring, you could probably even tell here he's like, I can't do this for much longer. So no. again, smart mind for the business. He has good ring psychology, and he's using that to basically carry him throughout these matches. Yeah, no, I'm with you there. Um, there was a point where Jillian Hall tried to uh, run interference, even though she's just working and doing her job because she has a clipboard. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're telling a good story here. Because of the fallaway slams, Rey Mysterio is uh, selling a lot of the... Uh, selling a lot on his back. JBL locks in a bear hug, Bruno San Martino style, and Rey Mysterio is in that hold for a while. Then Rey kind of makes his comeback, Tornado DDT, Head Scissors, Bronco Buster, greatest hits of Mysterio. This finish I actually thought was really freaking great. He hits yeah. a hits a 619, goes for the West Coast pop, JBL ducks under, Mysterio hits the ropes, and gets hit with a massive clothesline from hell. Like, damn near takes Mysterio's head off. And JBL pins him, 13-minute match. I'm going to go three stars. I think it was a good match. You know, I'm going to match your three stars after thinking about it for a while. We talk about JBL kind of entering the last phase of his career, like, in-ring-wise. He is really at a point where he needs to be paired up with the right opponent or the right stipulation, or the matches are going to suck. Yeah. And I think Ray was a good opponent for him. I think they have... Decent to good chemistry. Um, they would few. They will few next year, and the matches don't even come near to, you know, the <clears throat> level of quality here. I won't even go as far right now. Uh, this is the best we're gonna get for them. If you're talking I'm, about Judgment Day 06, I don't remember much of that match, and it's a oh very no, nothing match. I, I I don't remember that match either, but maybe it's better than we're thinking. So we'll we'll get to that when we get to that. Um, yeah, but here it's like I feel like this is the best it gets when it comes to JBL and Ray. Um, these I two feel like are going to be yeah. on and off rivals for the next you know year or so, and mm-hmm. by that I don't mean they're constantly feuding throughout the year. I mean they'll wrestle a pay per view, then they'll leave each other alone. They'll have an interaction, leave each other alone. They'll have another pay per view match. You know, it's very on and off, like for the remainder of JBL's career. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely also think that JBL winning was the right call here because he has lost. A lot of big matches in 2005 to the likes of John Cena and Batista putting them over. So the story here is that JBL, along with his new image consultant, is back on the right track. Um, I I don't want to say that JBL is, like, going to go back into the world title picture or anything. And he's damn ready for it. But 
Yeah, he's not going to touch he, that. He's not going to touch that world title until like you know Judgment Day or come damn near close to that world title at least until then. But yeah, I, I was going to say if you are not a JBL fan, don't worry. He, I feel like when he does go back to the world title picture, it's just for like, oh, we need a big baddie to feud with the big baby face, and it'll mm-hmm. be like a one and done. But he's not going to touch the world title ever again, and he will like he'll get like knee level into the world title picture, like here and there in 06 and then, you know, here and there in 08, but it's like, it's nothing like, Oh my God, we're not going to get another six month world title reign, or we're not going to get another like three no. pay-per-view feud with him mm-hmm. in the world champ. It's like, yeah, he knows his role at this point in the business. And well, you know also the better or worse, he, he fulfills it. We'll also get JBL on commentary for a while, which will be very interesting to talk about when we get to that point. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we will cross that bridge when we get to it, though, because that is... Mm-hmm. Oh. Okay, so here is one of the big selling points of this show, Tomas. It is the first ever handicap casket match. The Undertaker going up against Randy Orton and his dear old man, Cowboy Bob Orton. Uh, This is basically continuation of a feud that's been going on since WrestleMania. Undertaker got one over on young Randall Keith. Uh, Randy Orton got his win back at SummerSlam with the help of his old man. So basically, Undertaker wants to put both Ortons out of their misery here. And he's like, I don't want to just face Randy in a casket match. I want to face both of you so you can rest together. (laughs) <laughs> and you know like here's the thing um i really dug the, the build to this match because I oh yeah about this. randy and undertaker have a very underrated match on smackdown to main event the show leading up into this and in the middle of that match uh randy and cowboy bob bring out a casket and this is very impressive especially for 2005 or in i mean uh taker goes to put randy in the coffin and when he opens it there is a full-blown wax figurine of The Undertaker laying in that casket. And it comes very close to spooking Undertaker. Undertaker does win the match, so these guys are, like, pretty neck and neck. They're like, you know, in all intents and purposes, this should be the rubber match. So Taker, you know, won the feud. But after that, Randy cuts a promo saying, like, yeah, you beat me last week on SmackDown, but when you opened that casket and you saw that mannequin, if that's a mannequin... That is the most detailed mannequin I've ever seen in my life. It's a full-blown wax figurine. Yeah, it looks like something that you would see in uh, Madame Tussauds Museum. Yeah, you've ever been there. Yeah, Randy basically says, you know, you may have beaten me physically, but I have you beat mentally. So let's let's finish this in a casket match. There is a great segment on SmackDown where Randy thinks he's brought out the casket with the the wax figurine taker in there, and I know this image has become a meme. Randy, he seems like perplexed and he leans into the casket and Taker just choo, puts his hand around his throat, choke slam style, and you know, goozles him, as a lot of podcasters say. Goozle! Like said, um, Undertaker wants to basically put both Randy and Cowboy Bob in a casket. There is a segment on SmackDown where he brings out a casket, he opens it up, and there are two identical wax figurines of Randy and Cowboy Bob. I really dug the build to this match. I oh, the build was great. The build was great. Yeah. And it should also be noted that this casket that Taker brings out for uh, Randy and Cowboy Bob is a giant casket so that both of them can fit. So Exactly. Mm-hmm. And again, this was a perfect continuation of the feud. And again, go and watch it. They have a very underrated match on SmackDown, which basically starts the build to this pay-per-view. Again, mm-hmm. I feel like that's my catchphrase on this podcast. Again. And again, this is really good what you can do when you don't have a pay-per-view every month for every month for everybody. While Raw <clears> is doing Unforgiven, SmackDown is able to do this. They're able to do a bull rope match for the world title. They're able to do a steel cage match between Eddie and Ray. They're able to do Taker and Randy on an episode of SmackDown to main event the show. Yeah. Really good stuff. Good yeah. Yeah. It gives uh yeah, it gives you a reason to watch those episodes of television there. Um so Taker starts off, I mean, the Ordens make their entrance first to the Hey, Nothing You Can Say song, uh, and then the Druids hey. come out. Nothing you can say. Uh, so uh, they bring the casket down, the Druids, probably a bunch of uh, OVW workers at the time. One of them was probably MVP. I don't know. But they bring the casket down. <laughs> I mean, he can't tell. He can't tell. 
Yeah, I mean, you can't tell. But, but I mean, I'm thinking, who was in OVW at the time? <laughs> one of them's probably Teddy Omega. <laughs> <laughs> one of them's probably CM Punk. <laughs> no, 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 no. We get him at WrestleMania. <laughs> one of them is... <laughs> So Who's to say he's not a druid here? Who's to say he's not <laughs> a druid? John Moxley. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. John Moxley is a druid at the Royal Rumble. So, oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> anyway, so uh, <clears throat> they bring the casket down. Taker makes his entrance, and it's goosebump inducing, of course. Taker starts off by throwing soup bones at both Thorntons, and it looks like he's just having his way with these guys. It's just looking fucking easy for the Undertaker. Uh, the Ordens eventually are getting the upper hand. They tease a suplex into this fucking casket, which would not end well. Would probably make Taker's back worse than Shawn Michaels' back was after 1998 if they actually um, did that. The first thing I noticed, and I'm not going to lie, I kind of zeroed in on this once the match started. How old is how old is Bob at this point? He's probably like in his fifties. Mid fifties, yeah. He was uh I here he was actually I have it in the rundown. Bob was fifty five years old wrestling in a dress shirt and jeans. Randy was only twenty five. Um which is so nuts. Give, give Bob props. Cowboy Bob was in there and he wasn't fucking around. He was no. bumping for the Undertaker. He was taking those suit bones. He was going down. He didn't take any slams per se, but again, like Taker is probably one of the stiffest strikers, but he's also one of the safest strikers at the same time. So Taker knew he was in there with a 55-year-old man, and he was like, I'm not going to take it easy on you, but I'm not going to break your face at the same time. So No, I'm also... Uh, a lot of brownie points in this match for he does. working at such an old age. My only nitpick is that Cowboy Bob was not wearing the cast, um, so I guess that means his arm must have healed finally. It's a miracle. Uh, it's, it's a, a miracle. fucking miracle. He doesn't go out with the cast on. Um, also, <laughs> fuck. Oh, God, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, Undertaker also must have uh, looked at Cowboy Bob, and he must have been like, listen, I'm not going to hurt you, but I'm also going to make sure, you know, I don't go. <laughs> I'm not going to go easy on you, but I also guarantee you I'm not going to give you any diseases while you're in there. I'm not going to give you hepatitis C or anything. The <laughs> so. Stay tuned for Armageddon. Stay tuned for Armageddon. So, um, I thought the match was pretty unique on its own because you look at the match and it's like, Taker's got to somehow stuff two men into a casket. This has never been done before. And you think it would be easier because one of them's, you know, a 55 year old man, but, you know, mm -hmm. Randy is on offense for like, you know, 95 percent of the match while cowboy bob is there to either provide a distraction yeah buy randy some time or you know he's there for support bob brings a lot of weapons into this match he does a steel chair or a fire extinguisher that plays well, a very pivotal point in this match bob is also no slouch on offense either because him and his son hit a double superplex on taker and taz actually does point out which is a neat piece of history and trivia which i'm glad that these commentators pointed out Cowboy Bob, I guess, made the superplex famous back in the day. So, which, yeah, you know, I, I'll, I'll I'm, believe that. Yeah, I'm also glad we got brought into this feud because as a kid, like, how old was I during this? Like, 11 years old? You think I fucking know who Cowboy Bob Orton was? So, and just when they brought him into this feud, it was good to have, like, a little history lesson. And when they mm -hmm. kept saying, like, oh, Randy Orton's a third-generation star, I'm like, well, I've never heard of his father. And after this feud, I'm like, oh, yeah, I know who he is now. Yeah, and you probably didn't know. Yeah, probably didn't know who his grandfather was either, Bob Orton Sr., who wrestled. No, no. Yeah, no, I, I didn't. Yeah, Randy Orton, third generation superstar. I believe his grandfather had passed away the year after this. But uh, can in we any the case, work on the line real quick so we can give me a history lesson. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cowboy Bob, I guess, also forgot the rules of this match when he tried to cover the Undertaker after the superplex, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, yeah. There's a point where Taker rolls Cowboy Bob into the casket. Randy doesn't get in quite yet. Taker hits an offensive maneuver, and he closes the lid on Cowboy Bob, which actually is a really smart move because it kind of neutralizes one guy, gives the old guy a break, <laughs> just mm -hmm. laying in the casket. Oh, yeah. Oh God! Of all of all places to take a break is inside a coffin. Yeah. But I'm sure Bob like signals to, to Undertaker like, "Fuck, put me in the casket. <laughs> I'm gassed." <laughs> only only in pro wrestling can you find uh, taking a break in a coffin uh, reasonable. But mm -hmm. 
Yeah, not not an Oliver Twist, but you can take a break inside a coffin in pro wrestling. But uh, yeah. makes it a one on one match, which is brilliant strategy by the Undertaker. Uh, Taker and Orton. I I don't want to say this is their weakest match of their uh, saga in two thousand five. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I feel like these guys did what they could with the stipulation, with how different it felt. Um, yeah, again, and I feel like this is a running theme with this pay per view. A casket match really isn't there to show off like a five star wrestling match per se. It's just it's a gimmick match, and you know they could have gotten a little more creative with like their environment. You know, some more weapons could have gotten involved. They could have had an announce table spot. Yeah, uh, you know, it, I, I could have like been they, a... they this match pretty contained. They kept it. They kept it simple, which sometimes yeah. works in a match's <laughs> favor, but. I would have liked a little bit more fun, but I get it. I get mm -hmm. why they didn't do it because Bob Orton's in there at 55 years old. So I get why they kind of wanted to keep the match a little bit more low key than usual casket mm -hmm. matches. Uh, yeah. Taker this is less of a milestone match in the feud and more, more like a chapter. Yeah. Per se. Per se. Yeah. Bingo. Uh, the crowd was constantly chanting rest in peace. And I forgot about this chant. I forgot that people chanted this back then. Uh, <laughs> he hits I like people chanted creative shit back in 2005. <clears throat> I thought that was like a, a 2016 and on. <laughs> Taker locks in a Hell's Gate on Cowboy Bob at one point before it was Triangle the Hell's Gate. Show. It's the fucking Hell's Gate. Uh, no, so... it's not. No, 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 no. How <laughs> did you get away with misnaming all the other movies? <laughs> there is a difference between a Triangle Show and the Hell's Gate. There yeah, hundred percent is. Thank you. Debatable. Uh, so Randy, <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, Randy oh boy, does oh the he does the corner punches, which you never do to the Undertaker because he'll slump over and give you the last ride. And Taz brings this up, and I'm glad that he did because he does that. And when Taker's getting ready for the last ride, Taz goes, "Why did Randy do that? Why why would Randy put himself in that position?" And thank you. That is something that has bothered me. You are like what entering the third act of a casket match. Why are you doing 10 punches? 10 punches is something you do in the first five minutes. Yeah. Now, again, it's like, imagine you hit your opponent with the finisher or like with the signature move, and then you're going to put them up on the top rope and just punch them. On what planet does that make sense? It doesn't total, make sense like, at all. Does not. Breaker for me. Does and not make sense. Yeah. It's literally an excuse for Taker to do the last ride without having to do like most of the work. So I've always hated that. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, oh boy. Um, so, Taker nails Orton with the last ride, and he goes to throw him into the casket. Cowboy Bob pops up because he's been taking a nap in there, and he's been holding on to a fire extinguisher, sprays the Undertaker with it, which is hugely ironic when you think about the story of this match, spraying Undertaker also, with a fire extinguisher. I love the sequence, because, you know, you forget about Bob, and then when the casket opens, you know, he sprays him with the fire extinguisher, and then Randy hits an RKO. <clears throat> I'm like, oh, that is a beautiful spot. Not and not exactly out of nowhere. Not exactly out of nowhere, but... But literally through, like, fog. I thought that was a really cool visual. Only, you know, imitated by Brian Danielson hitting uh, the Busaiku knee on Kane after he went through the flaming the table. The running like, knee. Busaiku the knee. running Fuck knee. You. Fuck you, Busaiku <laughs> knee. But, you know, he hits the knee after the fire extinguisher is on Kane. It's just like, they come out of nowhere through the fog. I thought it was a really cool visual. Randy hitting the RKO on Taker. Oh, yeah. And this leads to my favorite spot in the match. So Orton hits an RKO, and Bob is directing traffic. Randy is rolling Taker in. Taker makes a brief comeback, pulls Randy into the casket with him, and the lid closes on both guys, and Bob Orton is just sitting there. And Michael Cole, with the line of the night, in my opinion, says, what do you think is going on in there? And I, all I was thinking was, they're having sex. Yeah, and Bob Orton is yeah. just waiting outside for them to finish. <laughs> That's what's yes, going on. Cole. You were at a professional wrestling event in a professional wrestling match. They're having sex in the coffin. Yeah, <laughs> no, obviously. What do yeah. you think they're doing, Cole? <laughs> what do you think they're doing? I mean... Get back into your box-like structure and shut up. <laughs> Well, I mean, to be fair, this casket is a box-like structure. So, um, with that said, Randy gets a steel chair from God knows where. Blast Taker right in the fucking forehead. And uh, they very quickly, the Ortons very quickly close the lid on Taker and they padlock it. Um, the Ortons win. 
Uh, the match itself, I thought, was fun enough. Um, I mean, I don't even know how to rate this, man. I, I, I thought I don't... it was fun. I yeah. thought this was a very fun match with the very unique stipulation. Um, I enjoyed it. I will give it three and a half. I thought. It was oh, fun. oh, damn. I, I mean, I'm gonna go three. I'm gonna go three on this. Um, I think it was better than I remembered it being. Um, I think Cowboy Bob certainly deserves a lot of credit at his age for going in there and not just phoning it in and doing actual mm-hmm. wrestling moves. Undertaker and Randy obviously had phenomenal chemistry together. Um, I don't want to say this was the weakest match in their trilogy, but I think not trilogy, their quadrilogy, but by proxy, it might be um, just because of the, uh, the goofy gimmick that was attached to it. Um, <clears throat> their match at WrestleMania was certainly better than this one. Match at SummerSlam might be slightly better. It was a good match. It was a good match, not a great match, but um, Orton's padlock this casket. They roll it up towards the entranceway, and immediately I was sitting there because I I believe I had the 1998 Royal Rumble on VHS, and even at eight years old going on nine, I knew where this was going. Uh, Randy like takes this axe and like a lumberjack just like chops into this wooden coffin and then <laughs> fucking cowboy bob uh cowboy bob brings out this gigantic red jug of gasoline and michael cole and taz are like oh no oh no that's gasoline meanwhile it has this gigantic label on the side that says gasoline so make sure that we and know that it's gasoline <laughs> so to peel back the curtain a little if you are not if you're just getting into wrestling or maybe you stumbled across, across this podcast and you're like what the hell they lit a man on fire no, in the casket, there is actually another compartment that it's like a trap door. It gets released and Taker rolls under the ring. So no, Taker was not actually in the casket. No, no, obviously, there. obviously he wasn't. Yeah, yeah no, the, it, the trap door would have to be on the side of the casket in that case. So um, <clears throat> with that said, I just wonder because, you know, it was an extra large casket. So I was wondering, maybe there's another compartment that Taker could just like, you know, drop down and roll under the ring. But Taker it can get out of the ring. And I also looked up how they do buried alive matches. There is a tunnel way in the grave that they crawl out of. And that's why you never yep. see the camera like look directly into the grave most of the time. They're trying Correct. to cover up the tunnel. Correct. So um again, the the Ortons douse this casket every square inch of this thing in lighter fluid. Almost looks like a brand new coffin getting a brand new coat of paint on it. Looks like a very clean coffin at this point. And I was gonna say it was kind of visually pleasing. <laughs> yeah, it was uh it was very uh satisfying if you're into that sort of thing, if you have OCD. So yeah, you kinda know where this goes. Randy Orton, uh yeah, God forbid you put a match in Randy Orton's hand. So yeah, he lights this thing on fire burns the undertaker to a crisp inside this casket and you know he's just sitting there and he just does this like his pose and i'm like Which is never actually a sick ass visual never of randy doing the pose in front of the fire never put fucking fire in randy orton's hands he's a pyromaniac like i can so, only <laughs> that whole after match segment how long did that take <clears throat> five minutes oh at least at least five um, minutes so throughout the duration of that time, nobody thought to stop him. No, no, because the Undertaker has no friends, and they don't. They don't. <laughs> this is the funny part. These fuckers at crew do not think to douse this thing with fire extinguisher until like we actually get the visual and the photo of Orton doing the pose. Like they let this man burn for a solid minute before they help him. You know. Security. No. They all could have surrounded him and pointed guns at Randy and arrested him. Yeah, and you you think you think this crowd in Houston, Texas, you wouldn't think that not one of them thinks to call the police. Like <laughs> you know. Only in very, very dire situations like Vince's limousine catching on fire was probably one of the only times re- wrestling fans actually called the police on the situation. But um very <sighs> odd looking on it as an adult to be like, they they just let this happen. Yeah. Like, nobody not to stop it. And I don't want to hear the excuse, oh, but Randy had an axe. He had the axe for like two seconds. Yeah. He, that whole time he was dousing the 
the cast getting gasoline, you know, he was getting ready pouring, to the Pouring gasoline into the hole so that theoretically the Undertaker was also getting lighter fluid on his body so that no, he all. was sure to be burnt to a crisp. There were a couple of instances where Randy was struggling with the lighter and his back was toward the entranceway. You can't tell me that a swarm of security guards couldn't have tackled his ass in that time. No. Stop this. Because <laughs> so weird. Randy Orton's Only gimmick. Randy Orton's gimmick is a pyromaniac, I guess. So <laughs> apparently, fuck yeah, he's more of a pyromaniac than Kane is. Kane's gimmick um, was actual fire. <laughs> like, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> like as a twelve-year-old so, watching this match, this shit traumatized me. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But this is gonna lead to probably one of the coolest return segments ever stay tuned for survivor series when we get there you know i was traumatized from this shit and the first thing i thought was again i had to watch undertaker get buried alive two years ago and again and i'm just sitting there thinking am i ever gonna see taker again he's like, <laughs> he's like one of my favorite wrestlers he's like if michael myers was a hero like every time you try to kill him, you can't. You know, you can't. You so, can't. You can't kill what's already dead. Was this? Yeah, I think there was an extra on this DVD where they brought the casket in the back. After it was all done, they opened the casket. Ooh. I don't own the DVD, but I'm sure I can go verify that real quick on YouTube. But in Again, any case, when I was first watching these pay per views. Um, you know, I'm 13 years, 12, 13 years old, and Netflix was still mail-in DVDs only. So I got all of these pay-per-views, and I watched the fuck out of them, and I watched the extras, and it was a good time. Yeah. Oh, super good DVDs time. don't even exist anymore. Nope. Sad. Nope. I... <sighs> Good lord, yeah. I'm I'm in a phase where I'm starting to clear stuff out of my house, and it's going to be sad if I have to, you know, sell all those things. I'm thinking about it because the network exists, yeah. but anyway... Yeah. Those were the days. Those were the days, man. Yeah, the network. It's on Peacock, but it's still the network to me, damn it. The cock. God damn Dwayne it. Dwayne Johnson's going to own it and call it Dwayne yeah. the Peacock Johnson. Okay, so we just witnessed a man get put in a casket. We just witnessed a man, like, completely obliterate this casket with an axe, Jack Torrance style. We witness this casket get lit on fire, be burnt to a crisp, and nobody helps this man for a solid couple minutes. Yes. Oh, well, for, this, uh, oh, well forget that. This. Here's. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. On go top ahead. of that, no, I just, just want to say, on top of that, there is a disgusting aroma of fire and burnt wood and gasoline wafting throughout the arena. And, you know, people could have passed out from this. They could have gotten sick from this. There were people sitting like 10 feet from this monstrosity. But what do they do? Oh, well, here's some racial stereotypes. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> cruiserweight title match. Yep. Who yep. dude is challenging Nunzio for the Cruiserweight title? I forgot. I didn't even know Nunzio was the champion at this point. When the fuck did Nunzio win this title? Was it on Velocity? Probably. Must have been. Um, spoiler alert. We are about to, the Cruiserweight title is about to become a complete afterthought after the Royal Rumble. <sighs> Fucking hell. Fucking hell, poor cruiserweight division. Like, it's on its last leg right now. Uh, because I don't even remember the, the, the history of this championship anymore. Anywho, we need a buffer match after what we just saw. It's Hoobie versus Nunzio. Do we? Do we? This crowd probably uh, should be sent home. They should have ended this pay-per-view if the Undertaker was killed. Like literally <laughs> Um Michael Cole and Taz aren't even caught talking about the match because you know they just saw the Undertaker die for the 15th time on pay-per-view. Um, these guys went seven minutes. It's not a bad match. I actually do. I think Hoobie and Nunzio have some good chemistry. They, they have do. Some good sequences because, you know, Hoobie's a great luchador who deserves better in this company. Yeah. Yeah, he is. And, uh, once he wins this title and then once he has a short run with it, he's gone. He's gone. The Mexicals just become a tag team after that. But, um, yeah, I mean... I don't want to say this is a bad match either because yeah. there are and some. He is the strongest member of the Mexicals. Oh. By far. Yeah. No, you know what? Thinking about it, I would agree with that. I love Super Crazy. Psychosis is a very gifted luchador in his own right, but 
the juice is probably the most gifted out of all of them. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, on commentary, Taz just goes, why do they call him Juice? He's like, Juice? <laughs> like OJ? And I'm like, tell me you're not interested in this match without telling me you're not interested in this match. Yeah, the crowd was the crowd was so dead for this thing, like just because they saw the Undertaker get burnt to a crisp. But uh, give these give these guys credit for trying. Uh, it also should be noted that Nuncio is accompanied to ringside by his new heavy, Vito. Who remembers do we Vito? Talk about this? Do we want to talk about this now? Because we are not sure. going to talk about it again. Sure, why not? Why not? Go ahead, um, Tomas. So Vito was Nunzio's heavy. Um. Was he in ECW or WCW or anything, or was he just he, WWE? You know what? I feel like I remember... <clears throat> I, ECW and WCW. He, he, yeah. No, he was in both companies. Wow. All right. Yeah, for he him. was in both companies. He was a part of the Mama Loops in WCW, if you remember that very, that very sad era in WCW. But here's the thing. He's in WWE now, and he's going to be Nunzio's heavy for like a second. And, and he's fucking... He's, we, he was fucking useless in this match because he tries to run interference and Hoovy dispatches of him pretty easily. He hits him with like a head scissors, sends him completely to the outside, completely fails to interfere for his man. Uh, and then Hoovy pins Nunzio with the Hoovy driver, a Michinoku driver in other terms, and he wins the Cruiserweight title. And Vito is despondent on the outside because he failed. He failed. Um, in all intents and purposes, this should have been a cooler and bigger moment than what it was because Hoovy gets the win. The crowd actually pops for him. Um, yeah. That's a cool celebrate with them. It's actually a really cool moment, but it's very buried underneath the fact that the WWE doesn't care about the Cruiserweight division. Imagine if this was Hoovy winning the United States title after like a 15 minute war with somebody like a bad oh. like a red. Oh God. Dude, this would be don't... amazing. Don't torture me with a good time that I could have had. Ben Juan, the Juice, could have had an awesome match. Like, like this could have been, like, the birth of Hoobie in WWE. But mm -hmm. it was just such a deflate, deflated moment because this was a six-minute buffer match. Which is which sucks. This happened right after The Undertaker was burnt, burnt to a crisp. Hoobie wins his only championship in WWE, and he celebrates with Carlos Cabrera and Hugo Savinovich at ringside. Yeah. Like, you know, that's Juice a really cool moment. Juice as the new Cruiserweight champion. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's a cool moment. It should have been a cool moment in Latino history, but it, very forgettable. Very, very, very forgettable. I'll give the match two stars. Same. Because um, I like what I saw. Matching I really it. Like what I saw. Yeah, both these guys tried their hardest, but they were in a position where the crowd just did not give a fuck. And yeah, that's a and damn shame. Vito. He is Nunzio's heavy for like five seconds. But Vito starts having an awakening, and he wants to wear a dress. There's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly fine. But in the context, Vince is putting Vito in a dress so we can laugh at him. Uh, they do a short stint on SmackDown where Nunzio doesn't want, to wear, want Vito to wear the dress, but when Vito wears the dress, he wins. So he beats Nunzio in a match. Vito goes on a small winning streak wearing the dress. And then Mr. Kennedy beats the shit out of him. We never see him again. <laughs> Great use of veto there, Vince. Awesome. There. Yeah. No, fantastic. Awesome. So now um, if you would have done this gimmick in today's day and age, and you would have made a really cool, like non-binary gimmick where he wrestles the men, but he likes wearing a dress and he likes being feminine. That would be fucking awesome. But yeah. Here in 2005, where it's literally being played as a fucking joke. What the fuck even was this? Fucking weak ass comedy is what it was. Vince McMahon probably yeah. sitting in gorilla going, Don't be a slut, button up the dress. <laughs> you know? Holy shit. Jesus Christ. A but, very mean spirited gimmick. Yeah. Oh, speaking of weak comedy, we get the final segment between Bobby Lashley and Simon Dean, which is actually sponsored by uh, Jack in the Box. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously joking. So Simon Dean finally finishes eating all these cheeseburgers but then it's noticed that lashley only counts 19 double cheeseburgers because the 20th was used as a weapon in the match and like it was completely like like smushed to smithereens and simon dean can't eat another one and <laughs> fucking he he goes to eat it 
he takes one bite out of it, goes into the goes to the John, and he just starts puking his brains out. Vince McMahon probably sitting there like, he's gonna puke, he's gonna puke. You he know? didn't even bite the burger. He like smelled it and he threw up. And that's why I'm sitting here going, Bobby Lashley, do you enjoy being a bully? Do you enjoy bullying people into an eating disorder? And this is this, this is your next big baby face, guys. This is it. This is him. Very, very weird. And I'm sure somebody in the writing team had a weird fetish. And why does I don't want to think about it anymore? Why did Why did Vince McMahon find puking funny? Like, there's nothing funny about that. You really want me to answer that question? No, 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 no. Not gonna get into it. Not gonna get into that. Exactly. Exactly. My point. Okay. So, we get to our main event, Tomas. Um, it's a very special match for uh, the good reasons and the somber reasons. We have Batista defending the big gold belt against the new and improved, as he's called, Eddie Guerrero. Eddie Guerrero is named number one contender by a very forgettable SmackDown authority figure. Oh, my God. So, Teddy Long is in the ring. He's getting ready to announce his number one contender. And he's... Teddy Long is cut off by his assistant, Palmer Cannon. And his gimmick is that he is like this UPN executive who's trying to take SmackDown to new levels. And he names Eddie Guerrero number one contender because he thinks it'll drive up the ratings and he thinks it'll be a yeah, great I match. Yeah, I remember Teddy Long is on the microphone and he's about to say like, and you're number one contender. I think he's about to say Rey Mysterio, actually. He's yep. about to say Rey's name. Palmer Cannon snatches the micro room Teddy Long and says, Eddie Guerrero. Yeah. It's like, what the fuck? We were robbed of Batista and Ray at the same review? Well, I mean, we wouldn't get Batista and Ray until 2009, one on one. But, um. Hey, he was supposed to be his friend. So, uh, Eddie Guerrero and Batista start this story where Eddie Guerrero feels like, okay, he's had this awakening since torturing Rey Mysterio throughout the summer. Uh, his new addiction is gaining trust from people, essentially. And Batista does not buy any of Eddie Guerrero's BS here. The story is essentially Eddie is trying to convince Batista that he can be a friendly guy. He can be a, he can be a valuable ally for him. Uh, Batista doesn't really buy it up until maybe a week or two before the event. And these guys are having a friendly battle uh, over the world title. Uh, a respectful... You know, Eddie Guerrero is still... Very much teetering towards the heel side, but the crowd is very much st slowly starting to get endeared back to Eddie Guerrero's graces. Um, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting story, but I want to talk about this build in hindsight, and I want to talk about it as if I don't know what's going to happen next. Yeah, so all things considered, as a kid. I was very confused by the storyline because even as a kid, I was thinking, wait a minute, you just went through all of this trouble doing this complete 180 with Eddie as a character. He turns heel, he changes his theme music, he does the most dastardly things you can think of. He tried to take Ray's kid away from them. Yeah. And then right after that feud, you're just gonna flip the script and make him a baby face again? Maybe so I didn't buy it for one second. I was waiting for Eddie to snap again hey, and lure Batista into his trap. We'll never know, but maybe in storyline, Eddie was bipolar and he just didn't didn't remember a damn thing that he did to Rey Mysterio. Like, yeah, but I also remember a couple of things about this feud. Number one, um, in the build, Batista, Benoit, and Rey were in a six man against Christian, JBL, and Eddie. And I remember Eddie getting on his knees after the match and begging Benoit and Ray for their forgiveness. So, like, mm. they were really trying to drive this point home. It's like, oh, maybe if he begs for Ray's forgiveness, you know, of all people, that'll, like, hook, line, and sink us. And another thing, a more lighthearted thing, I love how Eddie called Batista Bautista during this feud. Which is Bautista! The correct, <laughs> which is Batista's name. It is the correct pronunciation of his name, Bautista, just without the U. But I just loved in every single promo. It's like, I want to be Bautista, friend. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be his amigo, Holmes. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. So I remember during this, this feud and even beyond the feud a little more before, unfortunately, Eddie dies. 
you know how like I have this weird Mandela effect that I could have swore in the 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 Los Guerreros theme song that they added Tajiri into it and they called him Tajiri Heat. It was just a joke that me and my brother did back in the day. But mm. I remember I tapped on all of Eddie's partners and it turned into Latino Heat, Chavito Heat, Tajiri Heat. I don't um, remember that at all. No, 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 no. It didn't happen. It was just a joke. But I remember me and my brother would joke and we added all of Eddie's partners to the theme song. So we said Latino Heat, Chavito Heat, Tajiri Heat, Mysterio Heat and Bautista Heat. So I always just think about that when I think about this feud. Well, Chavo Guerrero doesn't exist in this uh, corner of the universe. It's Kerwin White now, but um, Kerwin Heat. Kerwin Heat. Fuck off. But um, Bautista Heat. Yeah. So there's also a tag team match that takes place on SmackDown. That's a huge integral part of this story, where Batista and Eddie are wrestling Eminem. Batista is going for the Batista bomb. Uh, on one of the members. I think Nitro hits him in the back with a chair, and it ends up, the chair ends up in Eddie's hands, and uh, the Batista, it's like he catches him with the smoking gun in his hand as if Eddie did it, but, you know, Eddie's trying to convince him that he didn't, and, you know, we're off. We're off, basically. Batista does not trust Eddie Guerrero. Eddie Guerrero is trying to convince him that he is a changed man. Uh, he's found religion. I mean, he already found religion in real life, but you know <laughs> but it's like i always thought it was interesting from the first promo where batista goes of course eddie i believe every word you're saying oh because my god the smile that batista had on his face too when he hugged yeah. eddie yeah friends don't take hands friends gotta hug friends and gotta hug. hug and eddie is just like <laughs> Why is he actually falling for this but it really played into the thing we talked about in the triple h dude that Batista's not an idiot. And it's like, Batista was more like, this dude, like, okay, I'll play along. But mm -hmm. let's see. It's just like, I know you're lying. Let's see how far you're going to go with this line before see, I rip your head off of your shoulders. This is why Batista was such an effective babyface back in the day, because he was an intelligent babyface. And mm -hmm. he was kind of playing mind games with his opponents as well. Um, you think maybe MJF and Adam Cole took inspiration from this? Maybe, maybe, but I mean, <laughs> unfortunate circumstances notwithstanding, MJF and Adam Cole actually get to finish their story. Um, yeah. This story was never completed. Who knows where it yeah. would have gone. Um, but with that in mind, Eddie Guerrero has, <laughs> again, he's changed his theme song. Like, he. <laughs> I want the sky how to this. turn to the gangster lean. I would be upset about this if this theme wasn't a fucking banger. Yeah, no, it, it really was. I, it's still a bop. It, he only uses it for this pay per view, but yeah, <laughs> I don't, yeah. I don't get the, I don't get the lyrics of this. I really don't get how it fits Eddie Guerrero at all. Time to get this party cracking. Time to get this party cracking, snapping. Yeah. No, no, what's happening? <laughs> I can. Tell you a yes man, and then gangsta late. <laughs> it's about time I stepped into gangsta late. Why? Why are you doing that, Eddie? Why, Why are you in the gangsta lane? Why is Eddie Guerrero trying to steal John Cena's gimmick now, stepping into the gangsta yeah. lane? And then, and then Ray is whooping ass, and he's asking for a referee when his shoulders are on the mat. Like, I don't get these theme songs, man. Yeah, I guess I guess it's because they wanted to give him like a tweener level theme, uh, aside from the straight up heel banger that he had throughout his entire feud with Ray. But yeah, who knows? Who knows, really? Um, <clears throat> yeah, eventually he goes back to his baby face uh, theme song before he passes away. But, and, you know, ironically enough, I thought Eddie looked, you know, we talked about his physicality and how like just sleepy he looks during the Ray feud. I thought he looked, and I hate saying this, you know, it makes me a little, like, choked up just to say it. I thought he looked very healthy at this pay-per-view. Yeah. He looked better than he did before. I mean, he still looks like a fucking square and way bigger than he should have been. Like, the yeah. muscles were bulging out the ass. Like, mm -hmm. my God. <laughs> like, this guy was... I mean, steroids like isn't ultimately... Steroids isn't ultimately what killed him, but mm -hmm. it's just... <sighs> but at the man. same time, like his eyes aren't as droopy anymore. They don't look bloodshot. He looks fine. His, yeah, his nose wasn't swollen anymore. Like 
it looked like he was going in a good direction. It just fucking sucks. Yeah. It fucking sucks. Yeah, it really does. Uh, he throws up the hook'em horns, by the way, too, like I said, because he's from Texas. Uh, Eddie made Batista work in this thing. Batista was no slouch in there with him. I don't want to say this was Batista's best title defense, um, but it was still definitely a very solid main event. It told a good story. And I don't want to say that Eddie carried the match, but he made Batista work. There yeah. was a lot of, like, joint manipulation. There was a lot of what Eddie is good at, and he was focusing on, you know, on the arm of Batista. He was putting him in a lot of submission holds, and you could tell just by the body language, it was like Eddie was telling Batista, you're not going to just do your power moves to me in this match. You're in a submission hold right now. Find a way out of it. You yeah. need to wrestle your way out of this hold. You need to think outside the box and not just focus on your bread and butter. It felt like a training session for Batista. And Eddie and Batista were very close backstage. So this was really Eddie being a mentor to Dave Batista in this match, which you read the body language of the guys in this match, and it was really cool to just study. Yeah. No, oh, Eddie was locking in a uh, Walls of Jericho at one point, trying to, uh, you know, crap. teach Batista. No, it was a Walls of Jericho. Yeah, he locked Boston in the... Uh... Are you talking about the modified sharpshooter? That's the lasso from El Paso, you uncultured swine. <laughs> I fucking loved using that move in the SmackDown vs. Raw games, and I was like, why oh, yeah. doesn't Eddie use this in real life? And here he is and using it, it like, the game. using it on a huge 318-pound man, which is very impressive. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Batista's throwing Eddie Guerrero, being the hoss that he is, you know, all the way around the squared circle, giving him body slams everywhere. Uh, there's a beautiful moment where after Batista's locked in all these submissions, which are dealing with his back, Eddie Guerrero hits a frog splash, hitting Batista right in the back. So Batista was not laying on his back like he usually would take the frog splash. Batista was lying on his stomach, and he took the frog splash that way. Um, that was a very, very clever spot, and very it clever. Was. Yeah. It wasn't even like an attempt at a finish. It was a transition move. Like, Eddie hit his finisher just to weaken Batista's back and then zeroed in on the back. Yes. I, I fucking miss Eddie. I, I miss him too, man. So there were I points there were points where he was tempted to cheat. He was tempted to go back to his lie, cheat, and steal mantra. Uh, like, for example, he has one of the tag ropes that was on the turnbuckle, and he could choke Batista with it. He throws the tag rope away because he can't do it. He's a changed man, and he would be a hypocrite if he used the tag rope. He introduces a steel chair a couple times, and uh, Batista is daring him to uh, nail him with the chair, and uh, Eddie can't do it. Eddie can't do it. <laughs> it's a, I don't know. It's a, it was a very compelling story that they were telling, and this was after the ref bump, right? Because there was a ref bump that led into that. Yeah, I want to say yes, there was a ref bump. Uh, Guerrero also slapped on a Texas clover leaf at a certain point in this match. Batista locks in a lasso from El Paso. A bear hug. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, the ref was Nick Patrick in this match. Uh, so you get a Nick Patrick Two, ref flop. One, two, two, three, three four. Oh, come on, Eddie, get off him. Get off him, Eddie. <laughs> yeah. I love Nick Patrick's voice. Yeah. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Get off him, Eddie. Come on, get off him. One, two. Let's do. Eat him. <laughs> Nick Patrick and last week. <laughs> oh, could you dude. imagine? <laughs> could you could you imagine Batista walking into a Carl's Jr. with the World Heavyweight Championship? No, I can imagine Lashley with the ECW title doing that. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. No, we're not at that point yet. Not at that point yet, you asshole. Um, so... Basically, yeah, Guerrero tosses the chair out. Guerrero slips out of the Batista bomb with the uh, sunset flip. Batista selling the back injury after he hits a spine buster, and he can't capitalize on Guerrero yet. Um, he can't even fully hit the Batista bomb either because that requires lower back strength in order to lift a man of Eddie Guerrero's size up for a Batista bomb. Uh, can't do it, but Guerrero hits triple triple verticals on Batista, which again is very impressive. 
Uh, Batista is a the giant individual. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, I know what I said. Swine. Yeah, he, uh, Guerrero jumps off of the frog splash, and uh, Batista nails Eddie with a spine buster, and that's it. He pins Eddie off a spine buster, and I was like, that was it? I mean, you got you got 18 minutes to work. You couldn't beat Eddie with a Batista bomb. Well, I mean, I guess not because Batista's I mean, back was hurting him. But I was thinking about that, and that could have been the reason why they went with this finish. It was, yeah, it was kind of a I don't want to say an underwhelming finish, but like a, you know, there was not a lot of oomph in that finish. Uh, this is before Batista started utilizing the spear, so it's not even he can do that yet. Um, it was a very interesting finish, but you could tell, you could just tell. This was not going to be the only match Batista and Eddie had. No. Uh, Batista retains the World Heavyweight Championship. I'll give the match three and a quarter stars. This Same. was not the greatest Eddie match of all time, even though it's his last pay-per-view match, unfortunately. But I do appreciate um, Eddie making Batista work. And the interesting take of psychology in this match, they were trying to tell a story with the back. And they mm -hmm. were trying to tell the story of, you know, uh, Eddie out wrestling Batista and Eddie kind of going back to his ring technician ways as opposed to the dirty tactics. It was like they were both handicapping each other in a way like Batista's back was really injured, and but Eddie couldn't cheat. He couldn't choke Batista with the tag rope. He couldn't hit a low blow. He couldn't hit uh, Batista with the chair. It was a very... It was a good attempt, I want to say. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there were solid story elements thrown in there. They were sort of teasing that Eddie was having that sly grin while Batista's back was turned and possibly a continuation of a story where Eddie betrays him. But we'll never know. We'll never know, sadly, because um, this was Eddie Guerrero's final pay-per-view, to your point. Uh, very sad because it also took place on Eddie's birthday, October 9th, um, his 38th birthday. Um, and a and month later... on top of that, yeah. after the show went off the air, Batista led the crowd in singing happy birthday to Eddie. Yeah. Yeah. Very sad. Yeah. And then a month later, Eddie's no longer with us. Uh, November 13th of 2005 was a day that traumatized me because, I mean, I, I don't want to get too into details because if you guys want like a full Eddie Guerrero retrospective and we can share our Eddie Guerrero memories as part of this retro, um, definitely let us know. But I will tell you this for I, I will lead off with this story. I did not know that Eddie Guerrero had died until maybe 8 o'clock p.m. that night. And, you know, I, I spent the entire day, I was, you know, I was having fun with my friends. I was, you know, at my buddy's house. We were playing cards and all that. Um, <clears throat> and my dad picks me up from there, and he's like, oh, did you hear another wrestler died? And I was like, oh, man. And I'm thinking it's like, I don't know, like someone along the lines of a Mr. Perfect or a boss man that wasn't with the company anymore. And he said, no, it was Eddie. And I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And sure enough, I search it up on WWE.com and there it is. The graphic says, in memory of Eddie Guerrero, 1967 to 2005. And I was just, ah, I was a mess. I was a mess. Couldn't believe it. So but. my story, I found out earlier, but in in grade school, I got bullied a lot for liking wrestling. Oh my God. Like you couldn't believe, like it's crazy to believe when I was in high school, nobody bullied me for doing theater, but oh my God, like me liking pro wrestling was like the target on my back. And you know, kids would make fun of me all the time. Ah, it's fake. It's fake. You like greased up men touching each other. You know, the usual stupid bullshit you could be told as a kid. Yeah. And I remember the stupidest insult I ever got was, I got upset about something. I'm sure like somebody took something from me in class and this kid goes, oh, he's mad because Rey Mysterio beat John Cena. And I'm like, the fuck? Kind of come up with better material, asshole. Uh, yeah. Also, Ray, Ray and John Cena are both faces. They wouldn't be fighting each other. <laughs> um, to put a little yeah. light on the situation. But I remember mm -hmm. I was at school and these asshole kids came up to me and I straight up, I swear they said, ha ha, Eddie Guerrero died. And I go, don't even fucking joke about that. Why would you even say that? What and assholes? That, like, yeah, I heard that like all day. Like Eddie Guerrero's dead, and I'm like, is this just some sort of fucking sick prank on me? So I brushed it off. And as I was leaving school, my teacher pulls me to the side and he says, "Tomas, what am I hearing about this wrestler died?" And that's when like my heart sunk, and I go, "I don't know. I thought it was a joke." 
And he goes, yeah, because I keep hearing about this, that this wrestler named what, Eddie Guerrero. And I go, like, I swear, like, my, my skin got pale. And I ran home as fast as I could. And I hopped on the computer. And that's how I saw it. And I'm like, fuck. Yeah. Passes away of uh, heart disease at 38 years old. And he leaves behind a wife, Vicky, and three daughters. Um, God, just horrible. Absolutely horrible, horrible, traumatizing situation for me as a kid. If, it, it was, you want you know, goosebumps and you want to keep a box of tissues on standby, go to Chavo Guerrero and talk to his Jericho, where Chavo gives his perspective on the situation. Oh, God. Yeah. Heart-wrenching. Mm-hmm. That Chavo had to find his his uncle dead on a hotel well, room floor. Well, he, he died in his arms, dude. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> terrible, terrible, and Chavo tells terrible. the story how he heard that and he kind of like got upset a little and go like, oh, did Eddie relapse again? And yeah. he goes up and that happens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if then you he... want a emotional like dramatization of the situation, the Dark Side of the Ring episode about Chris Benoit where they go into detail about Eddie's death. Yeah, um, specifically part one of the Benoit special. Yeah. Um, like cause... I said, have the have the tissue on standby. Or yeah, Chavo, that man has been through the fucking ringer. Yeah, I if I ever meet Chavo Guerrero, I just want to go up to him and give him a hug, just because. Yeah. Good lord, what that man has been through. He is a he is a Guerrero. He's a warrior, literally. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, so Eddie Guerrero. I still miss him to this very day. It's almost been fucking 18 years since it happened. Shit. Like, Jesus. I was like, 11 years old when that shit happened. Mm-hmm. I was, I was, and I was eight. I was eight. Yeah. So, um, I, I will save all like the aftermath when we do this Eddie pod, because it didn't just stop there. You know, there was the tribute shows. There's how Eddie's death really impacted me. As a yeah. Fan. And I didn't know this. I get into right now. Yeah, I didn't know this until much later. But a detail that I didn't even realize until much, much, you know, later down the line. Um, those tribute shows were shot on the same day that Eddie died, because um, they were doing uh, they were doing a super show in Minneapolis, and then they were going to go on a European tour shortly after that, so they could record the episodes in advance. So while they were doing, you know, all those dates overseas. You know, they could still air the episodes, you know, in time. But no, they were going to record those episodes on that Sunday, November 13th. Eddie dies that morning and they decide to make both shows tribute shows. So, yeah. yeah. And like I said, I want to save all of this until we do the Eddie pod because there wasn't just Eddie's death. There was watching that tribute episode of Raw with my parents. That was very difficult for all of us. There was... The, ep- the tribute episode of SmackDown, there was watching all the interviews, there was, um, again, just how Eddie's death really impacted me as a fan, because I swore I dedicated my life to that man for like a year after Eddie died, and it really didn't help that they kept mentioning it on TV. Like, I get it, in some ways it was very didn't tribunal help. towards Eddie, but when they started weaving it into storylines, it was just like, you're not letting us as fans, like, grieve. You're not because you're constantly bringing it up. Yeah, yeah. Can and only imagine the how the talent part. felt. So yeah. that was um, the hardest part of me because I think that's what really affected my psyche and how I couldn't stop thinking about Eddie because they wouldn't let us grieve about it. Yeah, but uh, rest in peace, Eddie. We miss you every day. Um, but yeah, do, do you think even the, this match, three and a quarter stars? Like, do you think it would be as memorable? As it is, if let, let's say Eddie is still with us these days, do you think this match is as memorable as it has become because it's Eddie's final pay per view? No, absolutely not at not. all. I agree. And here's the thing the only reason why it would still be in my memory banks is because I watched this pay per view live. If this yeah. was for a pay per view I didn't order live, let's say a Armageddon 2005, it wouldn't be. Yeah. I remember the pay per views that I ordered and watched live as a kid. But if I didn't, then I have to be reminded of them. Yeah. Um, with that being said, we don't know what Batista and Eddie have else in store after this. I fully believe Eddie was going to beat Batista for the world title because that's just where the storyline was going. Yeah. Um, and we can either confirm or deny that. I know there were stories of a Eddie Shawn Michaels match at WrestleMania. Again, we don't know 
what actually was going to happen. But overall, as a pay-per-view, this was very underwhelming, and there wasn't a lot of good to this. I'm going to give it a 5.75 out of 10. I was going to give it a 6, but... A little again, too generous. Very, very subpar. Yeah, the, these matches, none of them reached the four-star level. Um, I'm going to go with a five and a quarter out of ten, just under No Way Out, which I rated at a five and a half. And the only reason I put No Way Out over this show is because it has that four-star John Cena-Kurt Angle match um, mm -hmm. and the novelty of the main event. But in that regard, this is still a very memorable show because you have the final pay-per-view match of Eddie Guerrero. You have Undertaker being burnt to a crisp inside the casket. Um, but <laughs> again, um, but yeah, I mean, SmackDown, I mean, I feel like this is a better SmackDown roster than the previous year's No Mercy. So I feel like it at least has that going for it. But certainly not one of 2005's shining spots uh, in terms of premium no. live events, if you want to call them that. Again, all things aside, you take out that, this is Eddie's last pay-per-view. This was a very just subpar pay-per-view. Yeah. And like decent at best. And that's being a little generous. Well, you want to talk about subpar pay-per-views. Stay tuned for the next retro pod. When we discuss taboo Tuesday on the raw side this a, time, which is a damn shame because I actually have a lot of memories with this pay-per-view, which I, I do too. To next review. I do too. I own the DVD. So I own the, I, I know this pay-per-view pretty well. I watched it quite a bit when I was younger. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned for that and much more to come. Hit that subscribe button. If you're new, uh, let us know, uh, which retro WrestleMania that you want us to review. We have a couple options, uh, in the pipeline. I'll go ahead and put a poll out sooner rather than later. So we can knock it out before, uh, <laughs> the big showcase of the immortals, the XL version of WrestleMania in Philadelphia, where Cody Rhodes, I'm sure, is going to finish the story, but we'll see. Yeah, you never know. Fuck off. He's going to finish we'll the story, but yeah. Uh, again, yeah, let's talk about some positive things. It is WrestleMania season here on the channel. We have a lot of great things in store, uh, not only with the big show WrestleMania. We got some WrestleMania uh, retrospectives to, you know, cook up. We might get Greg involved in one of these. I know he has a busy month, so... No promises on that, but we'll hit him up and see if he wants to do something. We have a WrestleMania in mind that I think he'd be very interested in talking about because his boy Bret Hart is on it, not once, but twice. Mm -hmm. um, I'm having a lot of fun watching his collaborations on his channel right now. And um, after WrestleMania, because you guys start looking at that, we got Backlash and we got AEW Dynasty to look forward to. So again, oh, yeah. Here on the channel. Always when I feel like it's going to be a slow month. Bam, three pay-per-views. <laughs> yeah, because AEW is deciding to do one pay-per-view a month, motherfuckers. Make us pay $50, $50 out the ass. Well, I, hold on. Will Ospreay versus Brian Danielson. That's going to be a fucking banger. I will buy that pay-per-view just, just to watch that match. You couldn't just wait till double or nothing, could you? Nope. Nope. Tony Khan couldn't wait. He needs more money. So... With that said, folks, stay tuned for much more to come. Subscribe if you haven't already. Commence that back talk. Thanks, guys.